Hello, everyone. This is criminal profiler Pat Brown, and today we go to the UK for the still very hotly debated, supposedly unsolved case, uh, unsolved murder of Billy Joe Jenkins. Um, so welcome everybody here who is in the chat room. Uh, we've got a nice crowd today because this is a really super, super fascinating case. Let me just quickly say hello. Um, no, so many people, I'm going to miss some of you. Uh, Lila is here. Lisa N is here. Christine Wilson is new to be new here and welcome. Um, let's see who else. Anne, Anne is here. Uh, Martin is here from the UK. Benny's here from Denmark. Uh, Lisa S is here. Um, da, 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 da. Aisha's here. Bookworm is here. Florence is here. Molly's here. Oh, I hope I, mean, I might be missing somebody. Carrie's now just coming to the chat room. So more people will come into the chat room. And if you would like to come into the chat room, it's not a problem. Actually, all you need to do is join Patreon. Uh, Patreon, um, Patreon helps support the channel. It's five bucks a month. It gets you into all the chat rooms for all the live case shows like today, all the hangouts, the phone-ins, and we have a community where we just talk about things as well. So it's, it's a great deal. And it also uh, supports the channel because this is a, a modest channel um, without a million subscribers. And I kind of like it that way because I get to talk to people and, and actually know who they are. So that's grand. Uh, also, please do just like and subscribe to the channel. That costs you zero, but it does support the channel. And I also do talk to my subscribers on YouTube. Uh, share, hit the bell for notifications. And if you have any case you're particularly interested in, you can either check the playlist or just put in the search engine at YouTube, profiler Pat Brown, and the case you want to know about and see if I've already done it. You can also support the channel by buying one of my books below or clicking the dollar sign and giving a one-time contribution. Okay, there. All right, let's get to this case because this truly, truly fascinating case. Um, uh, I'm going to, it's a little complicated. And so I'm going to try to break it up in a few different ways to help you understand what happened in the case in general. Then um, what the evidence was that the police believed made made him a suspect and what the prosecution thought was clear enough to get him convicted. And then what the defense said, and then what's happened over time. And then I'm going to go through the different pieces of, of uh, evidence. And I'm going to explain to you how I think this all plays out from a criminal profiler's point of view. And I base my analysis on evidence. And I say this all the time because there's a lot of people on YouTube who do very good true crime stuff. And then they give opinions, but if you don't understand the evidence, the question is, uh, it, do you have a good analysis? And this is an educational channel. I'm trying to teach people how to analyze evidence and see what it actually means. And it's not that somebody's, you know, you could absolutely be 100% right all the time. But I just want you to help you understand how you analyze cases and how they end up in court and then what happens from there. So, all right, so let's get to it. All right, I'm going to explain, just to begin with, uh, the usual Wikipedia beginning because it's Wikipedia, but it has a very concise explanation. And for those who know nothing about this case, it's a good place to start. All right. So Billy Jo Margaret Jenkins was an English girl who was murdered in Hastings, East Sussex, in February of 1997. The case gained widespread media attention and remains unsolved. And unsolved meaning that this man, her, 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 she was a foster child. And then at that point, I think they had gotten some kind of special. She wasn't quite adopted, but it was a kind of in-between state. So you could call her a foster, call him, a Sean Jenkins, a foster father, or you could call him a father, whatever you like. But at that point, um, he was in the beginning arrested and convicted of her murder. So at one point it was, quote, solved. And then it goes on. And I'll explain that to you. Her foster father, Sean Jenkins, was originally convicted for the crime, but after two retrials, in which the jury was unable to reach a verdict, he was formally acquitted. Um, and I understand why the jury had problems coming to a, a verdict. Again, we're talking about civilian juries, which, you know, I'm a, I'm a huge opponent of the civilian jury system because I think you can't take 12 people off a bus stop. And I don't know what it is in the UK. How many people? <laughs> I don't know how many people on the jury in the UK, but um, in the US it's 12 and they're just grabbed up and they have no training and they do the best they can with a very, this is a very difficult case. Uh, so uh, whether they came up with guilty or not guilty, I'd understand their, their, their issues with trying to figure it out. 
So anyway, he was formally acquitted. Um, he has been denied compensation on the grounds that there's no evidence to prove his innocence. So after, you know, he spent six years in prison, uh, he's like, hey, you know, I, I was innocent. Uh, oh, they said, no, 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 we can't prove you're innocent. We can say you're not guilty according to the law. So they didn't want to give him any money. Um, he holds the rare distinction of having been acquitted despite never having been found not guilty by a jury. A second charge relating to lies he had conceived about his qualifications in order to get his job as a deputy head teacher was left to lie on file. And, uh, so there, I'll get into the issue of he lied on his uh, uh, CV uh, to get a job, um, which is an, <laughs> kind of a minor crime, if you want to put it that way. Um, and if the if the the school to which he applied didn't do their due diligence, then they got taken. <laughs> and, you know, stupid on you, school. Uh, but on the other hand, it's interesting as a character issue. Okay? I'll get to that in a bit. All right. So since this acquittal for murder, Sussex police have maintained that there was there were there were no plan. There are no plans to reopen the murder investigation, probably because it's too much pain in the butt. All right. And maybe because they also believe he's guilty and they don't want to go out. They have nobody else to go after. So whether that's true or not, they just don't want to bother with it. All right. So um, his killing, her killing, not his killing, her killing is one of Britain's most high profile unsolved murders. And that it is truly a fascinating one. So that's why I think it's it's worth talking about. Okay, that's the basics of the case. Um, now, let me tell you, I'm trying to decide how to approach this because I want to tell you that the general concept that the police had and why he was convicted. Then I'm going to show you where I got my some of my information from and why it's so important where I got it from. Okay, um, let me go there now because I like to let you know how I uh, analyze the case because unfortunately I could not access any police reports. There are no, I couldn't get find an autopsy report. I couldn't find uh, uh, crime scene photos or even crime scene depictions. A lot of stuff just not available. Now, either I'm a crappy researcher in that sense, but I just couldn't come up with it. And so I don't know if the UK is different from the US who likes to throw out everything on the internet, but it was hard to find anything that I could say I have absolutely been able to access this information. But what I did access was a number of different sources. Um, now, okay, where'd it go? Oh, there it is. Okay, so I accessed, the most important source I accessed was this. Uh, this is a book written by Sean Jenkins. It's called The Murder of Billy Joe, uh, and it is written by Sean Jenkins and Bob Woofing. I don't know how to pronounce this guy's name. Woofenden. Woofenden. He's no longer with us. He died in 2018. But let me tell you who Bob Woofenden is. He's um, He was a journalist, and he got really into uh, kind of Innocence Project type of things where he fought for people he thought were innocent. Um, he, he wasn't always successful. There was one case where he absolutely believed the guy was innocent. And when they retested the DNA, they're like, no, nope, he did it. <laughs> so, and, and I, I can't fault him for that because I mean, you know, in a sense, you don't know what the DNA is going to show up. And you, if you believe this person's innocent and you want to try to help them, I get it. Um, but this is his thing. Okay. This is his thing. And he has a website and this is the website. He, mm, hold on a second. Let's see if everything's out of order here. <laughs> Where's my website? Okay, there it is. Okay, this is his website, Justice for Sean Jenkins. Uh, so uh, this is, he has the facts of the case and um, and all the information about this. But of course, this is from the a website called Justice for Sean Jenkins, and it's put together by Bob, Bob himself. And I, I want to point that out because over and over I tell people that it's very difficult sometimes when you're analyzing a case and you're using information on the internet, especially coming from one perspective or another, and when it comes from the defense perspective, a journalist uh, who's into the innocence project things, you have to understand that they are going back over everything and they are then writing what they want you to know. Now, it could be the truth, but it could be revisionist history. And that's problematic. It could be even changing a few little words that just make you go, hmm, and therefore you get you, you don't know, and they start leaning one way. You know, maybe they may, you know, 
hey, this is all wrong. The guy shouldn't have been convicted. So it's difficult for a lay person and even myself to read these sites and know whether we're getting accurate information and then like, oh my God, the guy is innocent or we're getting inaccurate information because it's been slightly adjusted and he's not innocent at all. It's, tr it's, it's, it's tough. But what's also interesting is when you read a book like this, and it's coming from Sean Jenkins and Bob, they have had time to be, determine what goes in the book. So this is a way that you can understand where um, this is not the police view, this is not the prosecution view, this is their view. Um, when I look at the Madeleine McCann case, I, I tell people that I did not write my own book on the Madeleine McCann case until I read Kate McCann's book. When Kate McCann's book came out, then I felt like, oh, this is information she wants us to know, and she's been able to write it down and think about it and make sure it's correct. It's not something coming from the media, so I can get it from the horse's mouth, essentially. And that helps me understand better what's going on. Um, now, it could be lies, but the point is it's coming from the person who wants to inform us of something and... So I like that. So I was very pleased to be able to read this particular book. By the way, um, it's boring as hell. <laughs> it's 400. Well, I don't know. It's a, I have it on my Kindle. So it said 400 pages. I don't know what it really is. But after like a few chapters, you're just like, yeah, because it gets into a whole bunch of, uh, it just kind of goes off, off the rails. Um, so it's, it's rather dull. But I did find a lot of good information in the beginning of the book, so I recommend it. I also accessed um, this, which is interesting. Uh, Trevor McDonald uh, did a, a great show. It's a UK show. He interviewed Sean Jenkins. It's a two-part thing. It's fascinating to watch. I recommend you watch that. And I'll link the below. Um, then there's another one. This guy did a body, analysis, a body language analysis. I have no clue who the guy is. I don't know if he's a true body language guy or is some somebody who's, you know, um, dabbling in it. I actually didn't. I don't know, but it's interesting. And I and I, I watched it and I thought, okay, you're making some good points. I didn't agree with all of them, but I thought some of them are very interesting. So that's something else that you might want to to check out. So so those are all the places I kind of access my information from um, as to what happened and each person that says what happened, <laughs> um, getting it from their point of view. All right, so let me try to explain. I don't want to go to the book yet because that's going to be very interesting because the book has, uh, Bob actually writes what sh what happened that day, not Sean, which I think is it's interesting in itself because he, it, what they do in the book um, is the book, the book. All right, so this book, they have one chapter written by Sean, one chapter written by Bob. So they go back and forth, which is not un, un, necessarily unusual. You get you get the person who's experienced his point of view. Then you get his defender giving, giving his point of view on what happened and what all the evidence is. What I find interesting about it is when it comes down to what happened that day, it's not Sean's words. It's Bob's words. I wonder why that is. And what I might say about that is if you have Bob say what you did that day, at least if it ever comes under question, you could say, oh, I didn't say that. Bob said that. So I just find that interesting because as a as a person who was accused of a crime, uh, if, if my foster daughter and I've had a foster daughter, mind you, um, was was murdered, I want my words to be on that page specifically from me. But he chose to have his representative put his words, you know, what happened on the page. And I just find that interesting because it's not like he didn't talk about other things. So just keep that in mind. But let me get to what happened that day because there's going to be different aspects of this crime, uh, which I'm going to talk about as far as the evidence goes. All right, so this let me show you just the basics is, um, this is Sean and he, he lived, this is his family at the time. He had four daughters. And I'm going to get to later on in his own words how this all worked out. And also, there's some really inter interesting information on the background of Billy Joe Jenkins. Um, so anyway, they had four daughters. They took in 
um, Billy, Billy and her brother, who was older than her, and he only lasted like a week or two. I think he was a lot older than, he was, than her. She, I think maybe five or six years. So he was a teen. She was like nine. Um, and after a couple weeks, they're like, no. <laughs> I'm going to talk a little about the foster care system because this, this impacts this case tremendously. Uh, but anyway, they ended up with just um, Billy. And she lived with them for, I believe it was five years before the murder. So she was like from nine years old to 14. There's a couple of differing dates on that. But anyway, they already had four girls and they took in, a, in another child. And I will read why Sean says they did this later on. But this is their family at the time this all went down. Now, where did they live? They lived in this they, they lived in this home and the, where they lived is really important. Um, and, you know, you may think, why is it important? Well, it's important for a number of reasons. They lived in a semi-detached home. I believe it's the one on the left. A semi-detached meaning that there was access to the backyard of the home. Uh, and, and this is the backyard of the home. This is, this is after, this is the crime scene. So you can see, you can get around there into there. Uh, let me show you the, um, let me show you the way into the home. Because this is extremely important and it's not really talked about too much. Okay, so in other words, you can come down this path here and there's a gate. There's a lot of issues over whether the, the gate being closed, the gate being blocked and all of this. And I'm going to get into that. And then somebody could go in through that gate, which is important because they would have access to the back of the home. And here is where the, the crime occurred. Uh, Billy was supposedly painting back here and well, not supposedly she was she was painting back here uh, painting these these doors and she was bludgeoned to death on the patio um, and that's where her body was found as well so that was accessible through that through this through this uh side thing you go through the gate and you can access the patio so it's not like it wasn't inaccessible to a stranger so that's very important to keep in mind all right so that's where they lived. Now, um, this becomes the next important thing. Um, let, let me read you what happened. Let me read you the basics on what happened. I'm not going to get into Sean and, and Bob's version of it yet, but let me just give you the basics. All right. On 14th of February, 1997, Sean and Louise Jenkins argued over Billy Joe who Sean would later describe to police as difficult. Okay. After arriving home from a trip the next day, Sean said he asked Billy Joe to turn down her music and evidence later indicated he was infuriated when she refused. Okay. This, I'm not, I, I'm, I didn't really want to read this part yet, but anyway, she'd been painting the patio doors. Let's just go there. Shortly after this, the bo body of 13 year old Billy Joe was found in the back garden of the family home in Hastings at East Sussex. She had been battered over the head with an iron tent peg. This is the iron tent peg. And it's a pretty solid instrument, let me say that. All right. Um, the tent peg had been left out on the patio earlier in the day by one of the other children in the family. Okay, I, I wanna stop right here just to say this. So it is said, and, and I say so it is said because there's a lot of interviews that were done I have only portions of those interviews from different sources, and I don't know how much time elapsed between those interviews and who had access to the children, so they would say what they said. But supposedly one of the girls put those those, those tent pegs out there, okay? Um, uh, let's see. The tent, okay. Uh, Billy Joe died within minutes of the assault because it was a brutal assault, so they basically just slammed her over the head a number of times and cracked her skull open, and she died. Police asked her foster father, Sean Jenkins, to make a public appeal. All right, blah, 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 became the main suspect. He had been the last person to see her alive and the first adult to find her body. This is true. He said he was out on the porch with her, and I'm going to read the description of that from his own book. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of uh, getting in the car with the kids and going going to do little, little errands and things. And this is where it gets to be fascinating. All right, so... So, but he was the, the first adult to find the body. His girls actually found the body. The other two girls went into the house before him and found her body and yelled, and he came in. All right. He was arrested on suspicion of murder. Okay. So anyway, going on, 
Uh, police investigations revealed um, erratic behavior by him around the time of the incident. You can always say somebody has erratic behavior. I have erratic behavior <laughs> all the time. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, and the discovery of 158 microscopic spots of Billy Joe's blood were found on his clothing. All right. Uh, I'm going to point out, let me just point out the basic physical evidence. Now we have this, this is the thing the, that she was bludgeoned with. It was a, an imp implement the family had. This is important because either Sean could have accessed this because it was simply laying out there or anybody who went down that, that the side of the house and came into the back of the house, which was not blocked to the strength extent where they couldn't access the patio some stranger could have come in and grabbed up that object and hit her with it so that object is only interesting in the sense that both sean or a stranger uh killer could have accessed that that's that's important uh in the sense that either could have done that now um they're, what they're talking about here is they're talking about microscopic uh, splatter on his shirt. All right, let me show you. Let me show you. They had these. Um, so so these, this is clothing here. And they said, they'll see, this, uh, there were some microscopic dots up there. And there were some on the shoe. Um, so that's the claim. And the claim is that this is what the police claim, that there are cast off stains from uh, impact. So in other words, when you slam somebody in the head with a, with a weapon and then you pull that weapon back, then blood flies off that weapon. It makes total sense. Okay. But I just want to point out, um, you ever study blood stain pattern analysis? It is so complicated. It is. And it's not easy. And that's why when you go to court, you can get the prosecution and the defense to come up with two totally different viewpoints <laughs> on blood spatter analysis. Very difficult. Um, but what the police say is, hey, he's got these microscopic things all this blood all over him. It means he was beating her with that that that's that 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 metal object. Well, the defense says that that's ridiculous because he would have more blood spatter on his body had he really used that thing on her. What they said it was was expiration spatter. Now, let me try to explain what that is to you. Okay, so expiration, where's my <laughs> sorry. I think it's here. Oh, there we go. Expirated spatter is usually caused by blood from an internal injury, mixing with air from the lungs, being expelled through the nose, mouth, or an injury to the airways or lungs. Expirated spatter tends to form a very fine mist due to the pressure exerted by the lungs moving the air out of the body. All right. Very fine mist. They're saying there's over 100 of these little things on his clothing. And therefore, if he, he was bludgeoning her with a, with a thing and the blood was flying back, he would have big blood all over him. But he's got these teeny little things. So it's expert. So the defense says it's, it's when she was dying <coughs> and she, in the air, it went through. This is a big issue in this case. Where did the blood come from? If he bludgeoned her, why wasn't there more blood on him? So that is an interesting thing. And this is one of the reasons he eventually got off was because they said, look, this is expirated blood. Um, uh, it's not, it's not, it's not somebody hitting her with a thing and throwing blood all over himself. Um, I looked to find, tried to find out how much blood was around on the walls or on the, and I can't find that information. I found one site that claimed there was a little bit that like there was something on the walls or I can't find any proof of that. So that's also interesting because if he's hitting her with this thing and he's going like this, there should be not only blood on him, but blood on the walls. All right. But on the other hand, just to point out, if somebody, if some crazy dude came in and bludgeoned her to death, you would think he would be leaving the place with blood all over him and on his hands and everything. And yet there's no blood drops uh, and, and this corridor going up to the house to the back patio there's no blood any place here so we have two sides of this it's like well <laughs> how does this work how does this work all right um let me explain the rest of the day because the next thing that's really important is the timing so 
what they're saying, what the prosecution is saying is that Sean Jenkins had access to this thing, which he beat her over the head with. Okay. But there becomes a, an issue over timing. All right. I'm going to put this picture up. Oh, that's not the picture I wanted. Uh, they put the other picture up. This picture. All right. All right. There, that circle is his home. All right. And one of the claims is that at certain point he left the home and she was alive. That's the claim uh, by him. And then he took this little, this, this little route around the park and went up to this uh, place to get some white spirit to clean up uh, paint with. And and then he came back and there was like 10, maybe 20 minutes at the most for him to do this. And so um, the prosecution claimed she was dead at this point. He had, he had killed her. And then he was just running up to the store to give an excuse that he wasn't there for 10 to 20 minutes. And some crazy dude came in or some rapist came in and killed her during that period of time. Um, he says that's he said that's what Sean wants to believe this. So Sean wants to say, hey, some guy came in here while, while I ran up to the store with the girls. And, and Billy, Billy was, was bludgeoned to death. Uh, the police say it's only 10 to 20 minutes. What are the odds that Sean is going to just decide to go to the store and somebody runs in and does this? Or was his run to the store an excuse? In other words, he was trying to set up that somebody could have done that while he was gone. All right. So let me tell you a little bit further from just Wikipedia. So after arriving home from a trip, okay, so she was painting outside. Shortly after this, uh, the body of 13-year-old Billy Joe was found in the back garden of the family home. She had been battered over the head with an iron ten peg five times. Okay, we already want this. She died with the minutes of the assault. All right, so he said that he had found Billy Joe in a pool of blood on the patio. A police investigation revealed erratic behavior. We talked about this and the, the microscopic drops. Okay, now here's the story that comes from the basic story. On the day of the murder, Jenkins was driving two of his natural daughters home from a clarinet lesson. Okay. Billy Joe had stayed at home to paint the patio doors in the rear garden in order to earn extra pocket money. According to the police, Jenkins launched the assault on her when he returned home. So he picked up the other two girls, brought them home, and then went out back and assaulted her. While his two daughters were waiting in the car in the front of the house, he then returned to the car, took the two girls to a nearby DIY store, yet took no money with him. Police say that he did this to provide himself with an alibi, supported by the fact that he inexplicably drove around the nearby park in a circle and had taken an unusual route which extended the journey time. Jenkins claimed they had gone to buy some more white spirit, despite the fact he already had some in his garage. He said that when he returned, he found Billy Joe dead. Police said the idea that a stranger broke into the garden, found a weapon, and killed Billy Joe during the same 10 minutes Jenkins was away, apparently escaping without anyone noticing, was implausible. Okay, so here's the picture. Let me show you the picture. So there's his home. And you see how the, the, the circle where he, he leaves? And instead of going left up to the store on the quickest route, he goes around the park and then he goes around the park again and then he goes up to the store. Now he has explanations for why he took this circuitous route. Um, one of the explanations is when he comes out of the house, let me show you the house again. Um, what's the word? Wait one second. Let me show you the house. This is the house that coming out of the house. Now, uh, by the way, I, I, I questioned this. I thought, yeah, why are you taking this? Why, why wouldn't you just go left? You're, he's driving. Look at the car he's driving. Um, he's driving a sports car. And I own a Mazda. I own a Mazda convertible. My car looks just like that car. And his claim was he couldn't do a three-point turn and go left. Just turn, go go and, uh, you know, go straight to the store. So he went all the way around the park because he thought it was too dangerous to do a three-point turn. And I'm thinking to myself, really? You have to do a three-point turn with that car? <laughs> <laughs> that made me question. And in case you're wondering what a three-point turn is, it is, uh, where is my picture of the three point? Here it is. A uh, three-point turn means that you cannot just come. I, I looked, and originally I didn't know they didn't have a driveway. And then I realized he's parked outside his home. So in order to do a three-point turn, because the road is narrow, he has to turn, go that, you know, one is he's trying to, he's moving away, and then he's getting stuck there, and he has to back up, and then, then go the other direction. 
he says the road is too too narrow it's too unsafe so therefore therefore what i did was just just drive the other direction and go around the park so i will have to say having examined that possibility does that hold water Well, I don't know. Um, I don't know the traffic on in that area. He said he had kids in the car. He didn't want to take a risk on their lives. If it's not that unreasonable to go the other direction and go around the park and not have to, you know, and get hit by somebody coming around the corner, I kind of get it. I kind of get it. I kind of think to myself, well, I don't know that that's proof. I don't know the proof that because he went around the park means that he was just trying to kill time. Because there's a lot of ways to kill time. I mean, you can, you can stop. You can, you can, you can stop someplace else on the way. Oh, like, did you want to get something to eat before we picked up those those white that white spirit? Yeah, you know, did you? You know, there's a lot of ways to kill time, without doing that. Now they will say that what's unusual is he went around the, the thing twice. He has an explanation for that, where he started out and thought this is stupid. And he went back home, and then one of the girls started whining, and he goes, "Okay, fine, fine, fine." So then he goes goes on to the store. And he doesn't have his wallet with him. So when he gets in the store, he doesn't have any have any money. So there's a lot of issues over his, his mental state at that point. But I, I would say the three-point turn issue and why he went around the park, I think that's exaggerated. I think there is a rational explanation for that. Um, of course, I always point out to what happened in the past. Because since I own the same car, and I have a stick, so... Man, I can do a three-point turn just like that. But I don't know that road, and I don't know his habits. So we would have to look back and say, did he ever do the three-point turn with the kids in the car before? Or was he always a very cautious man and went around? This is a part of investigation that would be very important to know. Is he making up a story for that moment, or is it just something he actually does? And we're just, you know, being, you know, oh, why did you do that? You wouldn't, and that's ridiculous. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe that's what he always does. So... Essentially, what he's saying is that he came home, um, and so now they've got it down to a very small period of time where he returns with the girls, and then he says, oh, my God. So, so 10 minutes passes while he's in the home. He kills her, and then he says, oh, we need some white spirits, so we got to run out. So he keeps the kids from seeing that he just killed their foster sister, and they jump in the car, and he kills time in order to say some dude came down this thing, some crazy guy came down this thing and killed her, or some rapist dude. Uh, because there were security issues in the neighborhood at the time. At least he claims there were. And there's, and there's some story that Billy was claiming that somebody was following her in a jacket. And so there's all these stories that have come up since. How accurate they are is always questionable. A lot of the stories come from Sean and from supposedly Billy. Um, so I don't know how really unsafe the neighborhood was uh, and whether someone would in broad daylight access this location. And why would they? I don't know, because they can't even tell if anybody's home, because since they're out, when we look at when we look at the house, there is no driveway. So there's no way to tell whether there's 700 people in that house <laughs> or just Billy out there painting in the backyard. There's no way to know. Now, that doesn't mean some crazy dude couldn't have wandered back there somehow to say, hey, let me go see if I can rob this place, wander in because he's crazy um, and do something now. Uh, let me stop and just tell you about two suspects. One is a crazy dude. And if that crazy dude went in there and accessed that weapon and killed her for reasons completely unknown, maybe Billy might have been a mouthy girl. So she might have gone, what are you doing back here? And he freaked and just went, bah, 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 bah. okay. But I find it interesting that there's not any blood trail. That I find interesting. Uh, there's another claim that she might have been killed by this um, rapist who was supposedly around the area at the time. Um, this dude, the, the claim is he'd rape people. And at one point he put a, uh, a, a, a bin, a bin liner over one, a, a girl's head one time only because he raped a lot of girls supposedly. And this was one time. And I always point out the one time issue because a lot is made of, it's, it's not something he does every crime. So maybe it was just a freak thing, but anyway, supposedly he did that. And uh, there was a bin liner that, that is involved in the story. I'm going to explain the bin liner in a bit. Now, it's actually black, but anyway, a bin liner. Um, and this was under her head at the time. And part of this bin liner uh, plastic was up her nose. 
which is very fascinating. So anyway, the claim is, oh, yeah, see, this dude's a rapist. So, you know, he, he was bin liners only, only once. But there's no evidence he was even around at the time. Um, there's some claim that he used to own a, a leather jacket and she was being followed by a guy with a leather jacket. So here we go again with these stories. It's just real questionable. And um, yeah, first of all, the bin liner wasn't brought by him. So she, the bin liner was just in the backyard, which her head was lying on when they found her. Um, and I'm going to, there's a very interesting story about the bin liner. So keep the bin liner in mind. All right. Um, but there's no proof he was anywhere near the area that had anything to do with her. So there's two guys, a crazy dude in the area that doesn't apparently rape, just he's crazy. This guy's a rapist and she wasn't raped. She wasn't sexually assaulted at all. So what, what was the point of him doing it? So as far as other suspects go, not very many and not very good ones. And no evidence, no evidence of somebody else accessing that location. Uh, the going down the, the little side entrance here. And there is an there is some issues about whether the door was open or closed. Now there is a claim, Sean makes a claim that he cleaned up that area and he closed that air, uh, that little gate thing and he put something in front of it. He put like a he puts like a big huge bag of stuff in front of it in order to pe keep people from coming in or keep you know whatever he think he people accessing it. It's kind of his safety precaution supposedly. One of his girls said later on that oh no I think when we left it was closed but when we came back it was open. So that's the uh, inference that somebody not one of the family accessed the back. But again, it's coming from one of the girls later on and who knows if she's been prepped or whatever reason she said that. We don't even know it's true. We do know Sean was out here messing with the gate. That's all we know. But, all right, so we got, we got Billy Joe. She's been bludgeoned. She hasn't been sexually assaulted. It's also uh, an issue that she is a, a virgin that is, that is proven by, by autopsy. Um, she has not been sexually assaulted. She's just been bludgeoned for reasons unknown in the backyard during a, a short period of time. Okay, that's all we really know. Now, but <laughs> there's a lot of information here that I want to now present to help you understand what I think the evidence actually tells us. What about what was used to kill her? What about the what about the bin liner? Does that have any meaning? Uh, what about the timing issue? Because it's a very interesting timing issue. And what about the character of Sean himself? What kind of guy is he? Um, is he a, just a wonderful family man who was willing to take a foster child in? Or does the dude have issues? And even if he has issues, do those issues apply to him killing his foster daughter? Is there any reason he would have done so? And is there any proof that he would have done so, even if he's a whack job, you know? These are the issues. So now next I'm going to go to the information about the family, Sean, and, and from the book, the explanation of what happened that day, which is where, the, where I believe the truth of the matter is. And that will prove, in my opinion, what most likely happened. So uh, I will stop just here, just for a second, check out your comments, because it's, <sighs> as I've been here for a while trying to explain this, um, uh, and it, it is a very com convoluted case. So, I mean, it's simple in the sense that supposedly she's painting in the backyard, she's painting the patio doors. Dad and the two girls go out to get some white spirit. They come back. She's dead. That's a simple, <laughs> that's a simple explanation. However, that's not exactly, uh, that all that is here. All right. So, wow. Okay. Um, let me go back here. Uh, oh, now Benny. Uh, apparently, Benny says he thinks Sean Jenkins is guilty. Carrie agrees with him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Benny says, Carrie, we're almost always on the same page. All right. Uh, the television interview Sean did was chilling. Did you watch it? And that's the one I have linked below. Very interesting. Uh, and, and also the, the, the analysis of that interview. Um, Lisa S. says, I've never heard of this case. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, and Benny says he saw that interview. Um, uh, interesting. The, the interviewer seemed entirely unpersuaded of Sean's innocence. Now, I want to stop here. Sean comes off as... So we, I'm not, I'm not going to say whether 
anything about the body language stuff, but he comes a little bit off, off as a little bit arrogant in certain ways. Some people say he's, I don't know, kind of slimy, you know. Um, I read in the book when you read his book, and some of the things he says are very convincing as far as his emotions go um, in certain ways. And mind you, he's been a headmaster and he's worked with children for years. He's educated, he's well-spoken. So that's, that's something to take into account. And again, we have to look whether he, anything is different from his usual way of speaking and acting to what we see in these interviews, just to leave that out there. Um, now, uh, let me see what else I have to check on before. Oh, <laughs> you, <laughs> Benny says, UK spirit, what is white spirit? You know, I forgot, I've been, I've been analyzing this case for days. So white spirit has become part of my, my head. So it's, um, it's, 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 um, Paint thinner. Yeah. Thank you, Martin. It's paint thinner. I, I, I forgot the U.S. name for it, paint thinner. So in other words, when, when one of the things you'll note uh, when he's talking about um, in his book that white paint had gotten onto the patio. So you want to clean that off and you need to have paint thinner or white spirit to do so. Um, that's that's important. And hi, Sarah. Yes, you are brand new. And thank you for coming. I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> um, let's see what else. Um, all right, let's see what Christine Wilson has to say. He couldn't have gone to the store to get an alibi because his other girls were waiting in the car unless he had decided to return home, then kill Billy Joe, and then go to the store for an alibi. Uh, and, and I'm glad you brought this up, Christine, because it seems unrealistic that he's picked his, uh, he's picked his daughter up from... Uh, they get, there's more, there's more running around than, than is known. I'm going to explain that in a minute. Um, his daughter was at a clarinet lesson. He picked her up from the clarinet lesson, brought her home. She dropped the clarinet off. Then they went back out. The two girls went back out, but Billy supposedly is still painting. And the other two girls he took back out to get the, the white spirit paint thinner stuff. Um, so it seems odd to many people that he leaves Billy, Billy painting in the back on the, on the patio. He goes to pick up one of the daughters from clarinet. He brings the, she comes back. Um, she runs up, drops her clarinet off. She's in the house. And then he says both to both girls, one girl's outside cleaning his, uh, cleaning a different vehicle. And then he says, come on. And the two girls jump in his little car. Let's go get the paint thinner. Bye-bye Billy. Okay. But the claim is after the girl returns home with the clarinet, Somehow in that little to bit of time between when she drops the clarinet off and the girls, uh, you know, and they go out for the paint thinner, he runs in the back, kills his daughter, foster daughter, bludgeons her to death. You think he'd have blood on his hands and other stuff. And then he somehow says, come on, let's go get paint thinner. And the kids don't notice he's got any kind of blood on him. And he's perfect acting. Well, they say he's acting a little strange because he doesn't seem to, he seems a little confused, but anyway, he doesn't have his money and stuff like that. But well, he would do that in that short of time. And then he, oh, I, I've killed her. Let's run up to the store and try to get 10 minutes extra here. So, or 15 minutes extra here so that some dude can come in the back and kill her. Is that logical? Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to address that. So, uh, and, and, but Sarah says, or want to be seen. Yes. If he were setting up an alibi, he'd want to be seen. So he has to go someplace public where there's even video where he's seen with his two daughters walking about. And then when he gets home and his daughters find his dead foster daughter, Oh my God, somebody must've done that while we were out and we have proof we were out. So this is the police story. Their theory was that when they returned home from the clarinet lesson within a few, a couple minutes there, he killed her. And then he got the other girls to go jump back in the car and go out to the store to get an alibi. The defense says you got to be kidding because if he did that at that time, how would he have time to even clean up enough or, you know, take it's too short a time for him to have done that and then get the girls in the car and go out. They don't, they don't find that particularly believable. Now, one of the things that happens um, after the body is found is that he does go back out to his vehicle out to this little, little, uh, little sports car and uh, uh, sits there for a bit claiming that he got confused and he was so, so freaked out over what had happened. He just found his dead daughter that he's now sitting. He just went out and sat in the car. The police said he's doing that in case there was any blood in the car. He wanted to make sure he had an excuse what the blood, blood ended up in the car. Like he's, so that's the police side of it. So 
But you see how confusing this is. Now, let me look a little further, and then I'm going to get into what I believe is the evidence. Um, Christine said, uh, okay, okay, sorry, I just read that one. Um, here. Uh, Christine says, he said in, in the interview that he could have killed time by looking around the store. True. He could. He would have also gained witnesses if he did linger in the store. Yes, so he's claiming that, you know, I was only in the store for like a really short period of time. And if I really wanted to get enough time for some dude to come up here and, and, and kill Billy, wouldn't it make more sense that I stayed in the store for not just 10 minutes, but 30 minutes? Or I stopped and got, uh, he didn't say this, but I always say this, I stopped and got fish and chips <laughs> you know, uh, for the girls or whatever. We stopped. So we, why didn't he kill off more time if he was trying to get an alibi and trying to give time for some dude to run up here and kill her? That's a good question. But I have an answer. What I think is is the reason why. Um, uh, but it's a very good point that that he made in that show, and it's a very reasonable thing to say. Why wouldn't he just kill more time in the store? Why wouldn't he lengthen that period of time if he was trying to set up an alibi? It's a good 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 point, Christine. That was an excellent point. And mind you, when we're analyzing cases, uh, there's always this kind of devil advocates thing which we do, and it's good to do because. Sometimes you just don't think of something and you go, huh, that didn't occur to me. <laughs> it doesn't matter whether you're a criminal profiler or a detective. That's why we have teams sometimes because people see things in different ways from their own experiences and just, you know, their, their analyses might come up, analysis might come up with a little bit different something. So Christine, excellent point. All right. So let's go for it. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, Lila, we just started and I think he done it. <laughs> um, Let's see. Oh man! And now Joe's here saying guilty. Joe is also a UK guy. So, um, um, all right, we got a lot of people saying he's guilty. But why? What? Where's the evidence that this dude is guilty? Oh. <laughs> Benny, I thought it was white wine. Yeah, white, white spirit. I know. I keep thinking that myself. I'm like, oh, I'll have some of that. Um, let's see. Also, what Benny says: If they were doing paint job around the house, could he have been wearing a suit? Those suits you wear to get not to get paint on you and get rid of that suit. Uh, good question, Benny. Um, there's no evidence that he did wear a, a, any kind of suit. He wasn't doing the painting. It was a, a you know. Let me let me go show you the picture again of the uh, of the location. I only found one picture of this, by the way, on somebody's site, and I was like, thank God I found a picture because I'm like, what does the porch look like? Because all I saw was the crime scene thing, and I got it covered up, which really annoyed me. Um, okay, so. She's painting these doors and this was her job. What he was doing was he was delegating different jobs to the girls so that they could earn money. And she and Billy was supposedly wanted to really paint these, these doors. Um, and that was how she was going to earn money. One of the other girls outside was washing a car. They have more than one car. Um, so there, she was washing a car outside on the front and in, in the street. So they were earning money. So he was not involved supposedly with the actual painting or handling of any of this. So in theory, what he was wearing when he was, um, when he, when he came home, found her body because his daughters found it. And then he found her body called nine, 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 nine. Um, and the police came and the EMTs and all that stuff. What he was wearing is supposedly what was, you know, what he was wearing. And that's where all the microscopic little, the blood spots came from that the defense says, no, that's when she was like, <laughs> in the last moments of her life <laughs> and went on to him, but not so, not like if you've been, if you've been whacking somebody with that, that heavy tool that you'd have back spatter coming onto you. It wasn't that kind of big droplets. It was so microscopic. It would come through the breath. So the defense has an excellent point there. And I want to really point this out. I don't think the defense is wrong on that. Okay. So now you're not going to know where I'm going because I think the defense is correct that those drops on his body were from her expire, a breath coming out of her and not from bludgeoning. Hmm. Now they all go, Oh, what is Pat Brown thinking? <laughs> all right. All right. So, um, uh, from what I read, Christine says, after returning from the lessons, the girls waited in the car and only he went into the house. This gets a little confusing and I'll, I'll read his thing from his book on that. Um, 
Lila says he could have whacked her once and realized that he needed protection, put on a sweater or something else, and taken it off and disposed or hid it. Thus blood, but not too much blood. Okay, excellent point, Lila, because this has to be something you have to consider. Did he have some way of covering himself so that he didn't get a substantial amount of blood on him? But then again, why did he get this little teeny microscopic drops on him? Because generally speaking, that is not impact spatter. Impact spatter usually is bigger drops. Expiration uh, spatter is usually very microscopic because it's like, you know, it's, it's very minute into the air. So, but could he have covered up? Well, that's a very reasonable question. I will address that in just a bit. All right. Uh, Lila says, and why would a dad take his daughters to buy paint thinner? Would they prefer to stay home or be any place but with their square dad? <laughs> uh, I will say this. I think, A, the guy's kind of a control freak. Uh, but but there's also the question, and people say, well, if he if he knew there were like weird people hanging around the area and there were security issues, why did he leave Billy, alone, Billy Joe alone at home exposed to possible creepy dudes? Of course, it was the middle of the day, but... So, you know, you can go both ways on that. Are you too controlling or you're not controlling enough? Or are you only controlling over certain daughters, but not other daughters? You know, one could argue that. Um, yeah, I mean, they're already home. Why not just leave them there with her and just run up to the store yourself? Because if you, unless you're you know, getting them something cool, why do they want to go to the store? That's an interesting point, which, again, um, we have to look at the personality of Sean and decide whether that's important or not. Sarah says he wants to be seen with the girls. I might have an answer for that. All right. Um, Molly says maybe he was panicked, took off from the house, took an odd route to the store, perhaps was pressured by his kids to get back home. He did succeed in creating doubt. Okay. The, the going around more than once. Yeah. Uh, is it possible he panicked at a certain point because something had happened he, and he got the girls out of there. He's gone the way to the, he doesn't know what to do. He's just running around and the girls go, why are we going here? And he's like, uh, I don't know. And he turns around. Oh no, we're going to go. Maybe, maybe. All right. Uh, this Sarah says, depending on material, what you're wearing. Uh, yeah. I mean, as far as, uh, um, there, there is an issue, is interesting issue with material and blood spatter pattern, and that's so complicated. I'm not going to get into it. <laughs> hey, you know, this is where things get crazy. Now, all right, I should have a, like an intermission here because now part two. All right, what actually happened? Who was Sean? Who was Billy? Billy Joe? What was their? What was going on in the marriage? Would he have a re any motive to kill Billy? And what actually happened that day and when did it happen and how did it happen? All right. I'm going to go there now. All right. First thing I want to talk about is the issue with his wife. One thing that's very fascinating about this case is when he got arrested within like a day, his wife had turned on him and claimed that she thought he killed her, Billy. And, and you know, you have to wonder in my experience, a wife usually stands behind her husband, especially in a circumstance like this, where she has no reason to believe that he would want to kill her, theoretically. And why couldn't a, a stranger come in? And wasn't he with the other kids? And and these, she's got four natural daughters with him. Would she want her daughters to think their daddy was a brutal killer who killed off their foster sister? You would think that a wife would stand behind her husband at least long enough to maybe believe over time that maybe he did do it. Well, she turned on this dude so quickly. It's phenomenal. And one of the things Sean says is, well, you know, the police are really good at just like brainwashing her in an instant. Um, and so they just, con they just made her think I did it. And therefore she immediately decided I got to get away from this guy. And she turned my kids against me and everything. That is really hard to believe. The fact that she turned on her husband and she, by the way, she wasn't allowed to speak in court about what she said her husband's abuse was, uh, which Sean says doesn't, didn't happen at all. She, he did never abused her or the girls, but she claimed she, there were lots of interviews that she that she claimed he did, and that wasn't presented in court. So that was interesting. Um, but my thing about the whole thing is I don't know if she's lying or not, but a couple a day or two, and she's turned on him. That to me is a big like. Red flag. 
as to what is really going on. So I want to just get give a little background on their marriage, a little background on how they ended up with um, the daughter. And there's a lot of interesting things about how they ended up with Billy Joe. And I want to talk about foster care systems and how that works. All right. He says, this is from his book. Uh, Lois was the eldest of four children, grew up with her family in Dorset. Um, they were uh, belonged to a rigid uh, religious group, uh, an offshoot of the Plymouth Brethren. Going to the cinema or television or watching television was not encouraged by the Brethren. In 1973, her parents left the exclusive Brethren, which was deeply traumatic for them. Lois's parents then started to foster children. Uh, so the four natural children grew up with a permanent foster brother and four other foster children who overlapped at various times. And this is important because Sean did not choose to foster children. Lois, his wife, chose to foster children. So it was through Lois, who also became a social worker, that she was interested in helping children. So the reason Billy Joe was brought into the family wasn't through Sean. And that's important to know because um, and that doesn't mean he's a bad guy or anything or that he wasn't wasn't supportive, which he claims he was totally supportive, but it was her idea, not his. So, and foster children, especially nine-year-olds coming into your family are problematic. And they had four daughters who supposedly, according to Sean, were, were super happy family with ha happy four daughters. And then they brought in Billy Joe and her older brother, and he disappeared within like a week or two because he apparently was too much to handle. And they kept her um, but she's already nine years old and she's gone through nine years of trauma. And let me just tell you what this trauma is. And this does not come from Sean. He says a little bit. Let's see what he said a little bit. Oh, wait, oh, wait, wait, let me back up. Let me go for the, let me, let me do the wife first. Then he says that, um, they had kids. Um, he was, became a teacher. And these were difficult years. I left for work at seven in the morning, taught all day. And so he's basically saying he was exhausted, came home at 10 at night. He taught adult education classes at night. So he was never around. So who was taking care of the kids was Lois. All right. So then, then he invents these, these things for his CV. Uh, apparently he wants a better job and his CV won't cover it. So his CV, he went to a lesser college and he changed the name to a really well-known respected university. And then he apparently he didn't do well in many of his classes. So he then claims he took all these great these classes and got high grades. And he also changed his, I guess, his major from physical education to something more impressive to somebody who's going to hire him into you know, being a superintendent of a school. Now, I want to stop here and talk about the difference between spin and lying like a dog. OK, <laughs> because a lot of people defend him and say, oh, come on. We all we all lie on our CV, kind of like, you know, we all lie when we go on Match.com. You know, yeah, I, I've said I was 10, ten years younger. Okay. There's spinning and there is lying. So a spinning is when you take your CV and you make yourself look as good as possible under the circumstances um, that you have explanations for things like missing time. <laughs> like for some reason you didn't work for two years and didn't go to school. What, what did you do? And, you know, some people spin in those areas. Like, I was traveling, which meant they might have been traveling. Maybe they were traveling because they they were doing poorly in school and they said, screw it, and went traveling. Um, so they use that. I went traveling. I wanted to see the world. Okay. It's not a lie. It's a spin. Um, but there is a difference between a spin and a lie. So he wasn't spinning. That dude was lying, straight up front lying. And he was lying to a, an educational institution where he was supposed to be a role model. And he's a big, fat, lying dog. That leads me to believe a high level of narcissism, possible psychopathy, because that's not something that is normal. And they're trying to claim it is. I'm like, eh, no, no, you, you might, you can exaggerate, but if like, I'm, I mean, occasionally on, on television, somebody said, Pat Brown, who's a retired FBI agent. I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> I've never been in the FBI. I've never been in the FBI. I never said I was, if I said I was, you ought to just, unsubscribe really quickly from the channel. <laughs> you ditch me really fast because I was never with the FBI and I should never say I was with the FBI. That's, that's, that's a flat, fat, a fat lie, a flat out lie. Um, so there's ways to spin and there's ways to lie. 
and there's a big line down the middle of it. Spinning is just showing yourself in the best light possible. Um, maybe leaving out something that wasn't too complimentary to you. Uh, but lying is lying. <laughs> the dude was a fat liar. And he and to a school, to be the, the head of a school, and you're lying about your background? I have issues. I have issues. Um, okay, there we go. Uh, Sarah says, so he's been a fraud to the world at least once, at least twice. He actually had an original CV he used. And then his claim is when he got even wanted the better job, he didn't know what to do about the old CV. So he just copied the CV. And so he lied again. Yeah. So that, that's, a, that's, that's a bit of a problem. All right. So anyway, he lies. Um, he said, I invented details on my CV. Now, this is the words of Sean. I invented details on my CV. It seemed an almost insignificant matter at the time. Lying like a dog is insignificant to you? I'm sorry. I would think that was major. Spinning? That might be insignificant. Lying? Not insignificant. The whole issue, of course, was to have major and dramatic repercussions later on. Yeah, it's called it as a reaction to your actions. You're a fat liar. They found out and it made you look like a bad person because maybe you're a bad person. <laughs> doesn't mean you killed your stepdaughter. I mean, your foster daughter, but it doesn't make you look good either. All right. So anyway, in February 1992, Lois had shown him an advert in a local newspaper about two children who were need of a foster home. The two children were Billy Joe Jenkins and her half brother. However, they were not given the full de details of the child's history and indeed were not to learn about them until several years later. I will, I can honestly say this may be true. Uh, having, having had a foster daughter and had, having an adopted son who I adopted at the age of five, I can tell you the foster care system will lie to you or just leave information out. They're not so honorable either. Now, let me tell you the background of Billy. So, cause this is important to me. Um, Let's see where I can find it. This was written. Um, this was written by a guy who has a site. It was an unfinished document, uh, unfinished web. It's on web press. Uh, I'll link it below. Um, uh, but he was talking about Billy Joe's Jenkins uh, life before she got in foster care. <clears throat> and this, I didn't find any place else. I don't know where he got it from, but. Congratulations on doing it. So anyway, her first, her mother, Debbie, this is uh, Billy Joe's natural birth mother, was born in January 1958, and she didn't even know her, her own father. And her life was complicated, shall we, shall we call it, for her own mother, who had four children by four different fathers, and who were brought up by her mother in Essex. Um, so Billy didn't really have a great role model. By, by, so Billy didn't really have great role models by their own admission in her early life. Debbie met Billy Joe's dad, Bill, in prison. Oh, great place to meet a guy. <laughs> On a weird blind date of sorts in the Wandsworth prison in London. A friend of Debbie, whose partner was inside, because well, they seem to like criminal dudes, asked if she would accompany her to form a foursome as such and to visit her partner's friend, which was Bill Jenkins. And so this was a start, which would be one of the most baffling and sad cases of murder in British history. All right. Bill Jenkins had served prison time for various violent assaults, such as bo grievous bodily assault, assaulting a police officer. Anyway, he got released from prison eventually, moved into Debbie's flat because she's an idiot, and eventually fell pregnant with Billy. All right. Debbie, Debbie and Bill's daughter, Billy Joe, was born in March of 1983. Six weeks later, they were married. That's nice. At least they got married. Um, in the east end of London, most children were named after their fathers, blah, blah, blah. So that's why she was named Billy Joe. Uh, their home was a menagerie of animals, including a Burmese python and two ginger cats. Okay. All right. Uh, she was temporarily, well, hold on a second. Yeah. She was temporarily looked, temporarily, Billy Joe, was temporarily looked after by her grandmother when Debbie was arrested and sent to jail for credit card fraud. When Debbie was released, she and uh, Bill split up after many booze-filled arguments and fights. And then Debbie tried to get Billy and their siblings back, but they couldn't find a place to live. So she handed the kids over to foster care. Okay, so then uh, uh, the, the, the kids are rolling around all kinds of places. Okay, so I'm not going to get into all that. Um, so then, yeah, so then they eventually showed up. Now listen to this. On Friday afternoon in June of 1992, Billy Joe and her brother arrived with social services and the children were placed with Lois and Sean on a temporary placement. Now, mind you, in the, art, the, in, in the interesting uh, documentary uh, interview, um, 
Sean basically says that that Billy Joe was just lovely. I think I think that McCann said that about Madeline too. She was lovely, and they all had this wonderful nothing but wonderful times with her. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. But here we say this. Here we see this. The catch to all of this was that Billy Joe's behavior was not mentioned too much, and wildness and violent outbursts became quite apparent very quickly. And Billy was very close to being excluded from her school in London. All right, so. There was chaos in their lives when they put Billy in there and the brother, they had to get rid of the brother really quick because he was super bad. All right. So anyway, she was not the easiest girl in the world. And now uh, this was written here, but let's look what he said. Let's see what Sean says, not on the television documentary, but here. As soon as Billy Joe started primary school, teachers remarked on her verbal and physical aggressiveness. I saw how fearless she was for myself, explained Debbie at the age of four. This is not fearlessness, folks. This might be psychopathy. She nearly drowned the little boy next door by forcing his head into a bucket of water. When she was five, she tried to attack a 14-year-old with a potato peeler. Okay. A lot of foster kids are born into homes that are dreadful. Then they're put in other homes that are dreadful. And a lot of times they have attachment disorder and they may be psychopaths by the time they're five. They may not be the easiest kids to get along with, and they may be dangerous to your own children. I've always warned people, never ever bring in a foster child that is older than your youngest child, because sometimes they will try to kill them. Um, and they, you know the younger child can't protect themselves. Be very, very careful. I mean, I am totally for trying to save a child. And that's why I've had a foster child, a foster daughter who was a teenager and pregnant when she came to me. And that's why I adopted my son who was five and who was in foster care for five years of his life before he came to me. But uh, what happened before they come to you has dramatic effect when they come into your home and the things that they can do. I, I had a friend who took in a foster child. Uh, first foster child tried to rape one of her children and the second foster child tried to kill her younger uh, to like a baby tried to smash its head in in the crib and that little girl it was a little girl who tried to smash her daughter's head in um because she thought oh you know she's only three she tried to kill her baby um and the seven-year-old the, the seven-year-old boy was the one that tried to rape her daughter so get, that's how bad it can be so a lot of times foster care foster people foster services uh social services won't tell you very much but having said that lois was a social worker she should know how these things work so she knew likely that this child may have serious problems. And she's got four other daughters who supposedly have lived this charmed life, unless they've been beaten by their father. Um, <clears throat> and now you're going to bring in a child who was going to cause havoc in the house. And apparently there were issues between the girls. So they, things weren't sweet. Uh, Billy was calling some of the girls uh, names that you wouldn't want to repeat. And so there was a there was tension in the house and they, they, some of the girls were angry that Billy was even there. So life was not easy. So when we wonder whether Sean could have harmed Billy. Yeah, because she was could have very well been very difficult to deal with and drive you over the edge, especially if you don't like people who will not accept your control. Uh, this another thing people ask is, was there sexual? Is there a possible sexual nature to this? I don't know. Uh, she was a virgin at the time. That doesn't mean that at her age, uh, that her step, her foster father couldn't have been putting the moves on her. His own marriage wasn't doing well. And it wasn't one of his own daughters. So sometimes that will encourage a foster parent who has a maybe, maybe a psychopathic personality to then decide this teenage girl who's a pain in the ass anyway, you can then control her and maybe get some, have some fun with her. And so I don't know. I can't say he did any did there was anything sexual in it, but I also can't say there isn't. And so that could be motive as well. Um, so we just have to keep that in mind. Um, so anyway, he said, I've never considered fostering, but Lois was one of four children and now she wanted to foster. So I gave her my full support. All right. Goes on. And so, so we have all these things happening. Oh, terrible things happening. Oh, look at this. Um, on one occasion, she attacked Esther, who was about five at the time. Remember I said, if you bring in a nine-year-old and the kid's five, you can even be in trouble. I heard screaming coming from Esther's bedroom and raced up to see what was happening. Esther had a plastic box full of dolls and Billy had been ripping off the heads and destroying them one by one. As I told Billy to stop, Esther launched herself at her and Billy reacted by grabbing Esther and pulling her hair so I had to separate them. 
As she grew older, grew older, Billy stopped using violence as a way of reacting. But you see, this is not, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not a, a totally perfectly pleasing family life. And then it goes on that she would be occasionally naughty, but she learned how to, she rarely sulked, blah, blah, blah. And then supposedly she was getting easier to deal with as she got older, supposedly. All right. And she became more reliable and independent. So he claims. And then she said she wanted them to adopt her. And so they sought a residence order and she, they became her legal guardians. All right. Now I want to point out about, where's, where's the issue about the wife? Oh yes. Oh, the things were there. Things weren't going well with the wife. Um, so he talks a lot about people breaking into the house and, you know, and then of course, you know, this is in retrospect, you know, how much of that was true at the time and how much he's making up this stuff for the book so that you can have suspicious people in the neighborhood. I do not know. Anyway. Uh, so things went, were going poorly with his wife. Um, he, they, she didn't like his politics. So emotionally a chasm developed between us. So, Lewis wasn't uh, enthusiastic about him applying to the new job because they would have to move and he, she didn't want to, but he took the new job anyway. And he said, I didn't want to move the family because the children were so settled. However, I wasn't sure about the job. I procrastinated. Then I decided I would go for it. So against his children's desires and his wife's desires, he moved them to this location and then he lied to get the job. All right. So that's all of that. All right. So I just wanted to point that out because Things were not necessarily peaceful at home. And now he's, he's basically saying he's not having a good relationship with his wife. And his wife has claimed within one day that he thinks she did it and that he was violent toward her and the children. I find that interesting. Did she just want, I mean, even if you hated your husband at that point, even if you wanted a divorce at that point, would you really want your four girls to think that their daddy was a murderer? I don't think so. That that to me just not that does not sit right. I find that kind of hard to believe, especially a woman who's a social worker. She would know the effects that would have. So if she actually went forward and said, you know, the guy's violent, I would think she's got a, a reason for saying that. Um, just saying. All right. Now, now I want to go to the day of the murder and what he says happens. Okay, on the day of the murder. Okay, uh, I want you to keep in mind a time frame issue. All right, and the different implements. Uh, okay, so let me go. So let me see if I can figure out the time frame issue here and put that up for you. Because that is really, really important. Um, I, let me see. Where is it? Hold on a second. Okay, is it? Oh, so I'm going to flip through a few things here. Okay, that's not it. Okay, hold on. I'm trying to find out when. Uh, is it here? Yeah, yeah sorry. Um, where, where did that go? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Gosh, I hate this when it happens. Um, I had the time frame exactly when the, the call was made. Um, okay, I'm going to have to go look for it over here because it's annoying me. All right. The one of the most interesting things about this case is the time frame is how much time did he have to kill Billy? Um, and according to supposedly what happened was that he left the house uh, about 320 ish, went up to the store, came back and at three, was it 340 when the phone call was made. I'm trying to get the, the phone call issue here because um, there is an exact time when the phone call was made to 999. All right, let me let me find it. Uh, the initial 999 call was made at. Wait a minute, where'd it go? Uh, come on now. Hold on one second. Okay. The call time was noted at 3.38 p.m. So almost about 3.40 is when the phone call went into 999. That's when he found her body and called, okay? So from the time he left the house, okay, with the two girls, went went on that roundabout, you know, going around the park and up to the store, stayed 10 minutes and came back. We're talking about a very short period of time, like 20 minutes. So he would have had to return home with the girls, kill Billy Joe in the back, then get the girls out of the house, jump in the car, go around the park, 
go get the stuff, come back and make the find her, find her, the girls find her, and then he finds her, make the phone call. Very short period of time, maybe 20 minutes, maybe. Okay. Now let's see what he says here. That's not it. Let's see what he says in the spot that I'm looking for. Okay. This is very important. All right. This is the phone call coming into 999 after they were go back home. Sean Jenkins acquitted of murder at the third trial. Now, this is the tape cassette for the 999 thing. He calls and he says, my daughter's fallen or she's got head injuries, which is interesting because she's been bludgeoned to death. So it's kind of an odd statement. There's blood everywhere. All right. I don't know where the everywhere is. Operator says, what? She's banged her head and is bleeding from the head? He says, yes. Well, I don't know. There's blood everywhere on her head. She's lying on the floor. Operator says, can I take your name, sir? He says, Sean Jenkins. Okay, says the operator. So she's unconscious? Is she breathing all right? He says, I don't know. I haven't looked. You find your foster daughter lying on the floor with blood all over her, and you don't check to see if she is breathing. Okay, just an interesting point. Now, operator says, okay, did this happen while you were out of the house then? He says, yes, I've just this minute got back. Operator says, all right, so you don't know how long it would have been. He says, I don't know how. Now pay attention to this. Well, in the last, I don't know, half an hour, three quarters of an hour. Half an hour, three quarters of an hour. Well, wait a minute. He wasn't gone that long. Why would he think she might have been murdered 45 minutes ago? Because they didn't get that. There's only 20 minutes in there at the most, right? Because the first time they returned home with the, with the clarinet thing, uh, she was supposedly alive. That would have been 45 minutes ago. And then they did some stuff around there and then they went back out to the car and then they left. And it was during uh, that was a, wait a minute. I have to figure out how this goes. Yeah. That when the clarinet thing, when she came back, that would have been, that would have been the 20 minutes. So if they'd gone to pick up one of the daughters and bring her back from her clarinet lesson and she went and put the clarinet in the house and then they rushed out to get the white spirit, that would have been the 20 minute thing. So how could she be murdered 45 minutes ago? Because weren't they all out picking up the daughter and all that stuff from the clarinet lesson? So... How is that 45 minutes in there? I'm going to tell you. All right. All right. Let's see what actually is claimed to have happened. But I'm going to go to Sean's book now. And this is Bob Wolfing, Wolfenden doing the speaking. But he is telling the story as supposedly Sean said it happened. All right. Pay attention. This is going to get really interesting. All right. So. Let's see here. Uh, wait a minute. Hold on a second. I've got to figure out who does. When was a clarinet? Okay. Charlotte had a clarinet lesson at two o'clock with her friend. All right. So then, there, then Lois went out and did something else. And then they dropped back. They drove back to drop off Sean. Lois then went off with Esther and Maya. Okay. She was with the other girls. Meanwhile, meanwhile, Sean's at home now. He had got back into the house. He found that both girls, that would be Billy Joe and Annie, those are the two girls in the house. All right. This is 45 minutes before the phone call, approximately. He found that both girls felt they had completed their initial jobs. Billy Joe had swept up some twigs and leaves into a black bin liner bag. Pay attention to the, the liner bag issue. Annie had cleared out the utility room putting some things, including the tent pegs, on top of the coal bunker. So that's how supposedly the tent peg got outside and was useful to the stranger. However, as this had a bashed in top, rainwater had collected there. And so the contents of the toolbox, hammers and such like were laid out on the picnic table on the patio to dry. Okay, so actually the tent pegs were all now on the picnic table in plain sight. Now the children are ready to move on to less menial, more responsible tasks. Now, what's always interesting in telling a story is sometimes 
when somebody actually is guilty of something, the story gets too detailed and too overdone. Just keep that in mind. Now, uh, the patio doors had needed painting since an attempted break-in. Here we have the break-in issue again. Although the intruders hadn't succeeded in getting in, they had damaged the wood and broken a pane of glass. This had been replaced, but the putty was still bare. The day before, Sean had got a tin of paint and a paintbrush. He then began to show Billy Joe how to paint the patio doors, starting at the top and working downward. He explained that she was not, of course, to get paint on the window panes. Well, that is kind of him. He's a, a bit of a control freak. Uh, I don't know, but if you don't want your kid to get paint on the, 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 the frame, on the windows, what you do is you put some kind of tape around there so you can pull that off and have perfect paint. But I guess you didn't think of that, Sean. All right. Now, Annie was waiting to start cleaning the Opal. That's the other car. So he, it's not the little car he's running around over the, the convertible. Sean took two cheap buckets, a beige one and a black one, from under the kitchen sink. He filled one with hot water and left it on the table, put detergent in the other. Picking up a sponge, went out to show Annie how to wash the car. Okay, now he's going to show Annie how to wash the car. Now, keep in mind, supposedly he's alone with the two girls, and supposedly she, uh, Billy is painting. He's doing all this stuff with cleaning up stuff and moving stuff around. All right, he goes out to the front. Now look, I want you to pay attention to the car. That car is not in whatever car, the other car that she's actually uh, washing is not near the house. It's quite a distance from the house. So the girl who's washing the car has no idea what the hell is going on in the house or what's going on on the patio. No idea whatsoever. He wants to show Annie how to wash the car. Then he returned to Billy Joe to find her painting the inside, not the outside of the doors, and explained again what he wanted her to do. So accordingly here, she's not following directions. She stuck her tongue out at him in jest. Well, we already know she's got, she's got behavioral problems. Was it in jest? Okay. But of course, it's amazing how kind he is toward this very, very temperamental child. So kind. She's just lovely. Um, he went back to Annie and helped her for a few minutes. And here's where I think the story is probably not in order, in my opinion. Sean continued tidying up. Why is he tidying up so much? Was he tidying up because he was doing some work around the house or is he tidying up for a different reason? He went to the side gate. And this is where the gate comes in. Remember the old gate issue. So let's go take a look at the gate issue because this, this to me is, is very important. And he's making it important in the story. Sean continued tidying up. He went to the side gate, which closed the passageway between the front steps and the garden and patio area at the back of the house. The latch did not work properly, which apparently Sean does not know how to fix in spite of the fact he's fixing all kinds of things and is so concerned about safety. Um, he removed the red broomstick that was used to secure the gate and put a bag of peat there to keep it open. Apparently he said that he was putting that bag of peat out there, this is some other claim elsewhere, to find out whether an animal was getting in or whether as a human. I guess if they could move the whole bag of peat, it wasn't a raccoon, okay? <laughs> That's what I'm guessing. He swept the area along the side of the house and around the utility room. So he's very, he's cleaning up this area and he's cleaning up behind the house. And then he returned to see how Billy Joe was getting on. All right, let's go back here. Now he's back on the patio. Billy, he said, what are you doing? Now here is the weirdest paragraph of all. And this isn't coming from the media. This is from Sean's book approved by Sean. Her painting was a mess. She was getting paint all over the windows. Well, probably because you didn't have her taping anything, you know, before she did it. And and believe me, it's not that easy for a kid to, to do that perfect, you know, pull the pull the you know the paintbrush down and okay. And you can always use a razor later and go like this, you know, Sean. Anyway, she she was getting paint all over the windows. He showed her how to do it again. He also noticed that she was squatting on her haunches and looked uncomfortable. So he fetched a blanket, folded it, and put it inside a black bin liner. Okay, the black bin liner. 
Remember, 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 remember the issue of the bin liner that was slightly stuck up her nose. Part of that bin liner was stuck up her nose. Why would that possibly be? But he made her this cushion. He took a blanket. And I don't understand why when, when, when one of the, after he didn't do much to help his daughter after the 999 call, the neighbor came over and she went to find a towel to stem some of the blood. Where was the blanket that he rolled up and put inside the bin liner? I do not know. I just may not have the information, but I find that interesting. But anyway, there were two bin liners supposedly around, by the way, as well. But anyway, this one's the, with a blanket inside it. Well, I think the other one had twigs or something in it, but this one had a blanket in it to make her a cushion to sit on. He demonstrated how to paint going along the bottom of the door, the bottom of the door here, bottom of the door, with a brush, which gave Billy Joe, this is the thing that I don't get, giving Billy Joe the opportunity to clamor on his back, putting her legs over his shoulders as if he were giving her a piggyback. What the H? Wait a minute. Okay. Your father is trying to show you how to paint very carefully. And in that moment, you climb up to the point where your legs are over his shoulder and you're falling over his head while he's trying to do this. What? So either she is a real handful and Will is not listening to him and is doing things that are outrageously obnoxious or something else is even going on there that is going on between the two of them in this piggybacky thing. Don't know. Then it says, she got down. Well, that was nice of her. She resumed painting and Sean walked off. No comment about you climbing over my head while I'm trying to paint. What happened in this instance? Did that really happen? Did he really just accept this and walk off? Is I don't know what happened in that instance, but that is the instance I think something went down. Not way later, but right then and there. Now pay attention. He walks off. He had got paint on his cuff. He also noticed paint on the patio tiles and realized he needed white spirit. This is the moment when he decides he needs to clean up the patio floor. Is it because some paint dropped or is it because something else occurred on that patio floor at that moment of that tussle that he has to clean up after? All right. Aren't I doing it properly? She called after him. What? Uh, you just ran over, you supposedly just hung on his head like a monkey. I mean, uh... now the next line. Oh my God. He returned and cuddled her. Of course you are, he said. <laughs> this is what you call somebody who's trying to bullshit you. Even if he didn't kill her at that point. That she was annoying the living crap out of him, getting paint all over the windows, climbing up over him like a monkey. He's going to come back and cuddle her and say, oh, you're doing a great job. There's a whole bunch of stuff missing in the middle of this. This is where I think the whole issue comes into. All right. This is when I think the crime went down. Not 20 minutes later. Not when he returned the second time, but before he even left the first time. The 45 minutes he claims it might have happened before when he made that phone call to 999 and said it could have been 45 minutes ago. This was 45 minutes ago. Pay attention to what comes next. All right. Annie was, Annie was tipping out the dirty water, so Sean refilled the bucket with clean. I don't know where this, she's tipping the water out. She's supposed to buy the car, all right, and went out to, to, with what he described as a leather to dry off the car. Subsequently, so now he's going out to, to Annie out of the car. Well, my guess is something happened in that, on that patio right here, and he's got to make sure Annie is not coming back that she stays out there on the front of that house with that vehicle. Then he goes out to there to help her out with some clean water and a leather, keep her busy. Subsequently, he remembered momentarily sitting at the kitchen table and snatching the kind of two minute respite that parents of growing children learn to be grateful for. <laughs> so now 
he's just sitting at the table. You see, that shows you calm. That shows you how nothing really happened. Nothing bad has happened. That's why you can sit at the kitchen table and be calm. All right. However, Anne, Annie soon returned for the dustpan and brush in order to clean the inside of the car. And Sean got the keys and opened it for her. She came back, but she, she's not coming into that area of the house. I'm pretty sure he's making sure she's not coming into that area of the house. She's going to block her before that happens. By then it was nearing three o'clock. Remember, the phone call came in 45 minutes later to 999. This is at three o'clock. I believe Billy Joe was already dead. That's when it happened. And all this cleaning up and extra time he had in there that he's doing stuff with the, with the water and stuff. Maybe the time he's cleaning up certain things and trying to figure out what he's going to do. All right. By then it's nearing three o'clock and time to fetch Charlotte because he's got to pick Charlotte up because she's, if he doesn't, then there's going to be something fishy about that. In fact, Sean was by now a little late. I wonder why, Sean. Why were you late? Annie wanted to go with him. Mm, see, Annie wanted to go with him. And it's interesting also when you when you look at some of these cases and they say somebody, especially kids, said they wanted to do this. It's because daddy told them they're going to want to do this. Annie wanted to go with him, but Billy Joe was listening to the radio and said she would continue painting. I bet she was. Mm -hmm. They arranged, they arranged that Annie would take over the painting on their return from picking up Charlotte. On his way out, Sean closed the side gate and used the bag of peat to hold it shut. So now he's claiming that he has closed this area up. So therefore, when it's open later on, oh my God, somebody must have accessed it. But you see, Sean's all over the gate issue. All right, so he goes and picks up the other kid, right? Now, now they come home. The, when he picks up the, the girl, Charlotte, the, the woman, the house she, the, he also has to drop off this other kid. And she said that was between 315 and 320. So he didn't, so I don't know what, so three o'clock he had to pick up Charlotte, drop the other kid off. So he's late already. So he's late. Now they went back to Lower Park Road. Charlotte quickly dropped her clarinet back into the bedroom, then came downstairs and opened the dining room door to go into the kitchen to get a bucket of water. The arrangement was while Annie was that while Annie would take over the painting from Billy Joe, Charlotte was going to wash the MG. Uh-huh, okay. But Sean told Charlotte to hold on. He sure did. Hold on. As they had to go out again. I don't think Charlotte ever got down to the kitchen, which acts when she would see what had happened. I think he stopped her. He had to, he had to pick her up. And once he picked her up, she's like, I gotta go home and do it. We're going to, he, he went home. I think at that point he may have been thinking we'll find her then. But I think once he got there, he thought maybe it was a better idea to set up a, you know, have a better, longer time. I don't know what was going on in his head. Cause you know, if you've done something terrible, you don't think straight. And you're trying to figure out, Oh my God, maybe I need to do this instead. So anyway, he said, hold on, Charlotte. They had to go out again. If the painting was going to continue, then they would certainly need white spirit to, to clean up, you know? Now, it turns out that they had white spirit in the house. And 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 in the interview, Sean claims that, yeah, it was a three-year-old bottle that was on a back shelf and he didn't even know it was there. Well, clearly he never even looked to see if it was there. He didn't even bother once. This is a guy that's a control freak. Didn't bother once to go and check to see if they already had it before they had to go make an entire trip to a store to buy one item. Yeah, all right. They went out again. As they reached the car, Annie commented to Charlotte that she didn't think the car needed washing, but Charlotte wasn't to be dissuaded. She was looking forward to the job. Sean always drove off in the direction the car was facing. He considered it too dangerous, especially with children in the car, to do a three-point turn on the winding road with free-flowing traffic. Again, I don't think this is a huge issue. The police did. I don't think so. Um, so he went around the bottom of Alexander Park and turned up the other side. It had been a lovely day, but it was now getting, uh, now it was getting too late to be bothered about painting. So he decided to return home. That's when he went around the park <laughs> and came back to the house. So I think he's just, at that point, his brain was fried. He was trying to figure out, what, the, what, do, we, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? Um, but he got there. However, as he turned back home, he could tell Annie was upset. Now, this is, again, a claim what the kids are saying. How desperate are you to paint, he asked. Very desperate, she replied. Okay, you've got kids who are just desperate to do chores. Okay. 
Annie's disappointment was not the only factor. He was aware that the little dispute earlier in the day about which of the girls was going to do the painting had been settled by arranging that each of them did some. So as every parent knows, uh, he had to treat the children fairly and keep his promises. Sean drove past their house and again took up the temporarily abandoned route to the local DIY store. Just as they reached there, however, he felt his trouser pocket and realized he hadn't taken any money with him because a guy's adult doesn't know that you need to take money with you to buy things. And he, he later blames that on saying, hey, my wife is just as stupid as me. She forgot her checkbook. All right, went on another errand. Okay. He only had a few loose coins in his trouser pocket. He checked in the glove compartment. There was nothing in there. The children, of course, didn't have any. I think I said to the girl, girls, well, you know, I've tried. Sean stated feebly. He turned around in the entrance and returned home. I thought he went in the store, but uh, it's a different story here. Okay. It was then that the girls discovered Billy Joe. And one of the things you do when, when you have committed a crime is have somebody else discover it. As they went to the house, the children running ahead of their father, as children do, there was suddenly a dreadful cry from Charlotte. Dad, Billy's hurt. She was lying on the patio facing away from the house and broadly parallel to it with her legs straight out. Her right shoulder, Sean noticed as he went to her, was slightly raised and on the left side of her face was against the uh, patio concrete. There was blood, thick blood all around her head. He realized that Annie and Charlotte were moving warily towards him and turned back to usher them out into the, play, uh, into the playroom. Both girls were crying and he was trying to assure them. Reassure them. Billy's has an accident. She's going to be okay. Here's an interesting statement. He was about to call an ambulance, but at that moment, the telephone started ringing. Already panicked and now racked with indecision, he was momentarily in a quandary. He wondered how to disconnect the phone and then simply picked up the receiver and slammed it down several times to prevent it ringing. Eventually, it stopped. Then he thought, have I really seen what I thought? So he went back to Billy Joe and pulled her up toward him. Only then did he get an inkling of the extent of the, her injuries. Now, this is where it is claimed that she expirated, I can say it, blood on him. <sighs> that she was still supposedly alive or alive enough to be able to have some kind of gas blow out of her, at least that. As I pulled her toward me, there was a squelching sound, he said in a statement. Her head was limp and she was covered with blood. I thought initially of trying to rend her mouth to mouth, but I was she was totally covered in blood. I was absolutely horrified. I then released my grip on her shoulder and ran back through the dining room. I was aware that Annie and Charlotte were crying in the playroom. I knew by this time what had happened to Billy couldn't have been an accident, although I may well have told Annie and Charlotte it was an accident. And then he calls for the ambulance. Now, and that's when he... He says um, he doesn't know what happened and she's not conscious. He doesn't know if she's actually breathing, even though he just held her in his arms um, and all of that. Now, that's when he says, I think it could have happened 30 to 45 minutes ago. And that would have been before he picked Charlotte up from the clarinet lesson. That was when Billy Joe was actually painting on this back porch and she jumped on his back and all these weird things happened. And he stuffed, he took a bin liner and stuffed a blanket in it to, so she could sit comfortably. Okay. What do I think happened? Let's take a look at something that's really important. And that is bin liner, although it's black, a bin liner. I do not believe that Sean Jenkins had um, blood on him that's back spattered from, from beating her because it was too microscopic. And so that should prove him innocent, should it not? But yet, oddly enough, when she was found, her head was lying on the bin liner. It is my belief that he put the bin liner, this is what I believe the evidence supports, Again, not saying Sean is guilty because we don't want to get sued here. Sean is guilty. I'm saying what the evidence tells me is a plausible theory. I'm going to purport a theory. I'm purporting here, not saying it's true. It's a theory that the bin liner was put over her head before the bludgeoning started. That would prevent a great deal of the blood from getting on somebody's clothes. So the, that impact spatter is not going to come back. The back spatter is not going to come back because it's going to be retained inside the bin liner. Um, and then 
when he says, when he explains how he held her in his arms and she breathed and she is holding her, when he says that with a 911 operator, let's look at this again. Hold on a second. Okay. Read this. Read this. What is in his book? Sean then crouched down beside Billy Joe. I don't think this happened when he came home and found her dead when it was the 911 call. I think this is what happened after he, most likely, if the, if the bin liner was over her head and he bludgeoned her, when she went to the ground, he pulled the bin liner off of her face and he saw this. I felt her neck. I moved her hair off the side of her face, he said in his statement. I then became aware that her forehead appeared to be different. It was misshapen. I also saw that her eye was swollen as if someone had punched her. I then noticed a bubble from her nose and I believed that she was alive at that moment. I also noticed that I had blood on my hands. I felt sick. I stood up and I tried to shake the blood off my hands. It was actually my left hand that was covered in blood. I don't believe that happened after he made the 911 call. I believe that's what happened. 45 minutes ago on the, on, on the patio. If Sean Jenkins put the bag over her head and bludgeoned her in a rage. And if he pulled it off and held her in his arms, that's when he noticed, oh my God, what have I done? That's when he, she would have expirated that blood on him. So yes, that could be exactly what that blood on him was. It wasn't from the bludgeoning, it was from the last breath she took, which he is claiming here. He is claiming here, I noticed a bubble from her nose and I believe that she was alive at that moment. And that moment had to be right after the bludgeoning because you can't tell me that if she was bludgeoned while he was out, he came home with the amount of damage that was done, she probably would have been dead by pretty much not breathing that much when he, when he was holding her his arms at that moment in time. I think that happened all 45 minutes ago when he said it might have happened 45 minutes ago. Now, I believe that he prevented Charlotte when she got home from coming into that room. I believe he had time. He was cleaning up certain things. I don't know if he was washing his hands. He had blood on his left hand. He's, I don't know when he was washing his hands. Maybe he did have some other piece of clothing on. Maybe that blanket, maybe that blanket he held up as well or put over her. Who knows? But where was the blanket? I don't know. Uh, but... I find it unlikely that a crazy person coming back here would have found any reason to take that bin liner and put it over her head and bludgeon her. He would have just bludgeoned her. And then he would have blood come on him as he ran out the gate. But that's not there. And Sean doesn't have enough blood on him to also have bludgeoned her without something between him and her if he did it. So I believe the bin liner was on her head when he bludgeoned her taken off and she died in his arms and then he had to figure out what to do and that's 45 minutes before when he said it could have happened and no other child later on they try to say that oh she said goodbye to me and stuff like that and i think that's all fabricated later on um but from his own statements here through bob you don't hear that his other daughter said billy joe one of the statements later is billy joe said bye you know i made some com and snarky comment at her so that she was alive when charlotte they left the house to go to the store, but that's not in, it's not in his book. Why, if that's so important, why isn't it in his book that his daughter, Charlotte, or the other girl, Annie said, made a snarky comment and I, then we left. In other words, they heard her voice and they knew Billy Joe was alive when they left the house to go to the store. That's not here. It's only in other, other places. And I don't believe it's true. I believe that from the time that 45 minutes ago, when whatever happened on the on the patio, those girls never saw Billy Joe again until they found her dead. Uh, that is my conclusion on this. Um, I see no evidence of an intruder at all. I see no motive for an intruder, except totally crazy guy. I find Sean's statements questionable. I find his, his past questionable. I find his wife's reactions questionable. Uh, and I think that the problem is nobody ever really thought about the fact that the bag could have been over her head while it was going on, which prevented the greater splatter onto him. And then that expiration splatter came onto him when he pulled the bag off to look at her to see what it, what, what condition she was in, what was he going to do? And I think they have the timing wrong. I don't think it happened right before they went to the store. I think it happened 
not 20 minutes before, but 45 minutes before, before he went to get Charlotte from her lesson. She was already dead. That's my belief, or close to dying at that point. Uh, so that from that point on, it was a cover, a cover up of whatever happened. That's to me what the evidence shows. Uh, so do I believe Sean uh, Jenkins is guilty? The evidence, in my opinion, supports that he is, but it also supports that the crime went down 45 minutes earlier before Charlotte was picked up from her lesson. Um, and I believe the bin liner was over her head when it occurred, when the actual assault happened. Uh, that's what, to me, the evidence supports. But I'll see what you have to say about this. All right, let me get here now. <laughs> oh, okay, let me go back to some of your comments now. After all of this, um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Christine says, Christine Wilson says, you wouldn't want your girls to believe their father is a murderer. And you would also, you also wouldn't want your daughters to find their sister murdered in the garden. Yeah, that's true. I mean, but that's not, but, but if you're the killer, you would, you would want your other daughters to find the body and not you, because that's, that's the way they often work. But the mother not, you know, so quickly deciding that he's guilty and that their father's a murderer, I, I find that hard to believe. I think she would at least hung in there longer, thinking, oh, that couldn't be true, that couldn't be true, no, 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 no. Even if he wasn't the best husband in the world, he, he would never do that. My, my daughter's father would never do that. Um, and then maybe over time you'd, you'd give in, but like the day later, yeah, mm, questionable, really questionable. <laughs> oh, sl sl <laughs> wait a minute, hold on, what did I just do? Oh, where'd you go? Oh, no, where, where does she go? I just clicked on something, and if I, I knocked off, I, I, Aisha said she was he heading out, and I just clicked on that, and now she's vanished. So I hope I didn't put her in. Uh, sometimes you hit the wrong button, and it puts people in like a like a 10-minute prison for like, oh, you're being bad, but she wasn't being bad. So um, let's see. Uh, <laughs> Joe says, so they met on a blind date in the prison? Wow, that's, that's where my life, <laughs> love life has been going wrong. You didn't know you can get, if you go to prison, you'll get more dates. And if you stay out of prison, there's something more alluring about you then more, more cool, you know, more cool. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm going to go down here. Uh, oh, that's interesting. Benny says that 999 call had a Ryan Widmer vibe. It was a bit off. Um, and he claims, and you know, one of the things that uh, Sean does is he claims that as, as many times the defense will always do is you don't know when you're in shock, you don't know how you're going to behave. And that is true. That's why I can't, I don't say everything is wrong about something just because a person's acting weird. Um, but I'm more interested in the 45 minutes ago that this could have happened because if she was alive 20 minutes ago and you knew you'd only been out 20 minutes. Now he's trying to claim he doesn't know how long he was out. I'm going to say you knew something happened maybe 45 minutes ago. <laughs> um, so that's, that's, mm. Uh, that's true too. Uh, like the Ellen Greenberg case, he didn't check either. When somebody doesn't want to check on their, do any, everything they can to save their loved one, regardless of blood makes me question because uh, I mean, I can't imagine, I don't care how much blood is on you. I'm going to push that blood away to see if you're breathing. I want to save you. I don't care. I don't care how horrifying it is. I want to save you until I know I can't. Um, but then again, people act differently, as, as they always say. Um, let's see. Uh, let me let me go back. What is what is he cleaning up? Yeah, well, he's cleaning up a lot, uh, and that that's one of the things that interested me that he's so busy cleaning up. Now he could be this just he's a day off from work, uh, and he's cleaning up. That could be what they do on their days off, and he's picking up the girls and taking them places and cleaning up. But I find it interesting. He's cleaning up a lot right then. And then he's taking that two minutes to sit at the table and just say, oh, I have a moment of peace. Oh, okay. Yeah. She's ruining his house. Oh, by the way, one of the things he says about somebody uh, coming in and attacking um, uh, uh, a Billy Joe is he says, he, he came into my house and did this. So I think that my house problem is that possession he has. Um, he was more, I think, upset about the guy coming into his house and killing his, his foster daughter. He came onto my territory and did this. So uh, it's hard to say. Um, 
Is he trying to explain some blood spatter away? Yes, I believe so. Because what happens is once you commit a crime and there's blood in different places, then you have to decide what to do about that. Um, and, you know, if it, if it is not a premeditated crime, and I don't believe this was a premeditated crime, you now are in a situation where things aren't good <laughs> and you're in a pan you are in a panic and you've got kids around. You've got a girl out front who's washing a car and she's going to come back in the house and you've got to stop everybody from finding out anything. And you're rushing around trying to fix things. You do what you can. And I don't know exactly what was done, um, but I just believe that something was done. And I don't think that a stranger coming in would have wasted any time doing anything. Um, uh, let's see. Well, that's true. It's a proven fraud and habitual liar. And Sarah says psychopath. Well, I, I'm not going to argue with that necessarily. Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, oh, I you know. I do not know. And I wish I did, Molly. Uh, and this is, again, I always point this out. One of the problems of looking at a case from outside is that if you don't have the information, it's really hard to be absolutely accurate. Um, and that's why I say I can only purport a theory uh, because I, I, I looked and looked for this information. I looked for the issue about the bin liner having cuts or splits from the blows. And I don't know. But I will also say that some of those bin liners, I have one here. This sucker is extraordinarily thick, and I don't know what kind of bin liner it was, but I think I could put my, this over my head and bash it with a thing, and I don't know that it would split at all. So, but I find it interesting the bin liner was under her head because supposedly also this is, how did the bin liner get up her nose? Okay, so supposedly it's the bin liner's up her nose. And if their claim is that there's, there's like this freaky dude out there, not the, not the rapist dude who puts supposedly one time put a bin liner over somebody's head, to rape them so they wouldn't identify. But this guy liked to stick things up his nose like plastic and stuff. So that whoever killed her one did a like a uh, some kind of um uh uh, uh so <laughs> I just blanked. Um uh, you know what serial killers do yes <laughs> do some special thing. What the hell? I've just lost my mind here. What what's the word for that? <sighs> Somebody come up with it because I've just lost my mind. <laughs> uh, not the MO, the, the, <laughs> this is my specialty too. Oh, the Alzheimer's is setting in. <laughs> the Alzheimer's is signature. Okay, came back. Signature, uh, the signature that he did this to, because it abused him and he did a signature thing. I, I don't believe so. I believe that the bag was overhead and when the bashing was happening, Maybe the end of the thing was pushed up her nose. That makes a whole lot more sense. And somebody thought it was, oh, I've bashed this girl's head in. Let me think. I'll take this bin liner and stick it up her nose. Really? Because her head was on the bin liner. So really? I mean, that again, this is a ridiculous scenario for some crazy person. So the more likelihood is that bin liner piece that got stuck up her nose happened in the bludgeoning, which means that the bin liner would have been over her head and then was pulled off to see what had happened. Um, what condition she was in, because if you're doing something in a, in a rage for whatever reasons, it could be because she didn't paint properly because she jumped on his back because there's some sexual thing going on. She wouldn't cooperate. I don't have any clue what I can't purport a theory on the exact motive that could be, but if that's, if gay was furiously angry and picked that up and put it over her head and started hitting her, he might like to see what, what condition she was in before he walked away. And he looked to see whether, Oh my God, is she? And then he says, Oh my God, she's, like her brains are falling out and, you know, she's, she's breathing her last and what, what have I done type of thing. Uh, so it's more likely that a bin liner would go up your nose when you're being bludgeoned with a bin liner on your head. Uh, so, but I don't, I don't know anything about the cuts on the bin liner or whether they would have. And this is what I would do if I were examining this case and doing a re reconstruction. I do like, you know, the old watermelon trick, you stick a watermelon in a bin liner and you beat the heck out of the thing and see whether, you have damage to the bin liner. Uh, of course, if there's bone fragments that could be stabbing through the bin liner, but I don't know because I don't have that information. So um, he could have claimed he killed her in self-defense. Instead, he would have a better case. <sighs> he would, but you know, if, if you if you kill somebody in a rage like that, <laughs> it's really hard to prove self-defense at that point. 
you know, you could say that she came at you with the with the thing and you grabbed it from her and, and, and struggling, you hit her. But it seems like her head was hit so many times. You kind of I think you'd rather go at that point with a stranger did it. And now now the supposedly the gate was op that 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 gate area. Remember that was supposedly now open. And uh, when he's running around there doing stuff, uh, cleaning up. I wouldn't be surprised that he reopened this and moved everything away to make it look like somebody could therefore access. But still, there's no there's no blood there or anything, and I don't necessarily believe that that's what happened there. Um, Christine says, with a liner overhead, the blood would have been inside. Turning it inside out, the blood was on the outside and the head lying on it. It would mean blood under the liner. Eh, yes and no, because whether it, okay, let's say you have the bin liner like this and you go like that, maybe. Uh, but again, you could just pull it up. I, I, you know, it, it's, unless I see all the crime scene photos and see exactly where everything was, and then things can be moved around. You know, a person has a few seconds there to, things happen at crime scenes. And this is what always makes people think something else happened. Um, they go, well, you know, there's 20 pieces of evidence to prove this person did it, but this one thing is so weird, we can't figure it out. And you're like, yeah, and I can't answer that question. I don't know why that's there either. Maybe because somebody somebody in the commission of a crime does something really weird for whatever reasons, and we just can't figure it out. And so it makes no sense. Or our, our first responder does something stupid, which, which, which can happen. Um, first responders have kicked things, they've stolen things, <laughs> they've moved things. Families, families find somebody, they move things a lot of times if, you know, if they think it's, uh, let's say somebody's committed suicide, by, uh, let's say, or let's say it's autoerotic asphyxiation, they find their son home with questionable, you know, he's hung and he's got questionable material in front of his body. And they're like, oh, let's put his pants back on and let's take that porn away, and run away with it and say, oh, I don't, you know, because <laughs> they don't, they, they muck up the scene. They, you know, and because they don't like, they don't want the scene to appear the way it actually is. So, um, uh, that's another good question. Uh, she would have tried to take it off. Not necessarily. Uh, but that's a good point. And I think it's a good point. I don't, again, know whether there's any hand injuries. I, I've, you know, I can't seem to find any autopsy information, but exactly what I, uh, there's like so many hits to her head and brain coming out. That's all I really know. And disfigurement of face. I can't seem to find anything about the rest of her body, like defense wounds or anything like that. The answer to that is yes and no. Um, and again, here's where we get, it gets really tricky. Let's say the guy goes like this and puts it over and she goes, what are you doing? And she, she's like this still. And he hits her over the head. And that first hit does her, makes her unconscious right there on her feet. She's unconscious on her feet right away. Then she has no chance. And this is interesting too, about the self defense injuries. One would think if crazy dude comes onto the property, the first thing this feisty foster daughter is going to do is going, what are you doing here? And she's probably going to turn toward him. And then if he's coming after her, I would think she'd have defense injuries all over the place, but she doesn't appear. I don't know. If she does, but I don't hear of any. So it's much more likely when you have no defense injuries that the person who did it to you is somebody, you know, because you didn't see it coming. You didn't expect what was going to happen to you. So you didn't defend yourself. Uh, and I, this is why I wonder about the, she jumped on his back routine which is such a weird statement to make that in the middle of painting, she would have, and, and her, he's leaning over and she jumps on his back, like pushes her legs here. What? I mean, that to me is just so out of, makes no sense whatsoever that I wonder if that's where the struggle went on and we don't know exactly how it all went down. Um, maybe, maybe she was painting and he put the bag overhead and he was on top of her and now she wasn't on top of him. Maybe some weird explanation there. Um, again, sometimes stories are created uh, by people who they're trying to explain away stuff in their own minds about what happened. So they create these stories that are just like more than they should be. <laughs> and then there's too, too weird. Um, definitely overkill. Uh, and that's, it's a rage crime. There's no question about it. There's no, there's no sexual assault. It's a rage crime, which I just, if it's a rapist, he's going to rape her because he, I mean, that's why I'd be there. Uh, and if it's a crazy guy, he would have, why, why is he, uh, then the crazy guy that they're claiming that could have done it, he wasn't even, I think he's got an alibi. And why would he have rage toward her? I mean, oh, he was coming in to steal something and she stopped him and he got mad. 
possibly, but I would think things would have gone differently. And all the stuff that Sean says in this interesting chapter through by way of uh, Bob um, is just too questionable to me uh, and everything else. Um, let's see. Uh, Christine Wilson says, when asked by Trevor McDonald if he ever hit his wife, he said he never beat her. Oh, good point. You're, good. You're doing very good analysis here, but never said he hit her. Yeah, and he stumbled. Uh, the uh, the link I have below uh, with um, the guy doing the the uh, his his analysis of the body language. I'm not saying whether I agree with every bit of it, but it's interesting that he stutters a lot. I don't know if he stutters in normal life, but Every time he's asked a question about things like that, he goes and he falls apart and he's looking at his lips and he's trying to get out of it. And it seems very, very like it, it, it seems like he is not answering quite accurately and he's trying to get around. And that's a good point. Now, somebody says, yeah, I never beat my wife. Yeah, I might have slapped her around. <laughs> I didn't beat her. Two different things, you know. And then what is beating? Is it one punch of beating or does it require 10? You know, Um Let's see what Sarah has to say. And he wouldn't want to be seen as a domestic abuser. He's got a good guy complex that's closely controlled and monitored. Very interesting statement. And I think very accurate. Um, in his whole book here, he presents himself as the just a wonderful human being. Um, he does everything his wife wants him to do. He, he accepts a foster child into his home who is causing nothing but apparently havoc. But he's there to care for her and and love her and all these kind of things. And he's got excuses for everything. Um, and, you know, I guess to some extent we all do. I mean, we all want to see ourselves as good people. And I, I you know, I, I try to just say to myself, okay, so let's say I was accused of some horrible crime. Do I want to spin <laughs> what kind of human being I am? <laughs> so again, there's a line between lying and spinning. Um, so somebody says, did you ever did I ever, you know, did you ever yell at your children? No, <laughs> no, <laughs> never yelled at my children. <laughs> so I would, I probably would not be able to defend myself on that. So I probably have to spin it a little bit <laughs> and say they deserved it, the little buggers. <laughs> but, but I could also lie and say, oh, I never raised my voice. And then I'd be really suspicious because I think a whole bunch of people might have a different opinion on that. <laughs> you know, yeah, I saw mom shrieking. <laughs> yeah. So again, the line lies spin. And I, and I find that Sean's statements are too far to almost, you know, is a, is a resurrected Jesus Christ in some of these circumstances. He's just the best human being ever. And you know, and, and he's so kindly about just everything. And he's never, ever done anything ever uh, remotely mean or unf whatever. So I, it's hard to believe him because he's, and some people call him smarmy, but he comes across as, you know, like he's and sneaky and he, uh, he's fabricating. And I have trouble. I, I, I understand the spin, but the lies I have issues with. Um Wait a minute, all American guy? Well, he's not American, so. <laughs> but the UK have their all UK guy. <laughs> um, good guy complex, yeah, maybe. Well, he he wants, to, presenting yourself as something is important, especially if you're the headmaster of a school. Um, you have to present yourself as a as a role model, as, a, as that kind of person who is, you know, first of all, you have to be good around, you know, people, <laughs> Can you imagine if you're not good around children, if, if, if anything came out that you weren't kind to your children and yet you're running a school and you're a teacher, you know, um, and, I, and again, I get a little bit of spin on that because, you know, parents are not perfect and, and we're not perfect with our, 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 you know, naturally born children, nor with foster children, nor with, 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 uh, uh, with adopted children because children can push your buttons. You know, I mean, sometimes they obnoxious little creatures and they will push you over the edge. And so that somebody yelled at their child, that somebody spanked their child, somebody wasn't as nice as they could have been is, is not unreasonable. But then there's a, then again, we go to a, to a point where you're crossing the line. And according to Sean's wife, he crossed the line many times in a way that was frightening. And so to believe her or not to believe her, 
Hmm? I guess that's an opinion. Um, Christine Wilson says, for the third trial, I keep saying Christine Wilson. The reason I'm saying that Christine is because we have another Christine who is not here today, but uh, she's another Christine. Um, for the third trial, the prosecution, oh, oh, oh I for, I'm glad you said this. Okay. For the third trial, the prosecution tried to submit evidence of minute pieces of bone in the blood on his clothing. The judge wouldn't let them in because it's too late. Uh, the defense had no time to respond. I completely forgot about this. Okay. Yes. There, there was a claim by the prosecution who had the, the things, again, reanalyzed, that there were pieces of bone and metal in blood drops, meaning, obviously, that he would, if he hit her over the head with the, the heavy metal bar and then the, the back spatter on it would throw blood, it would throw brain, and it would throw possibly little flecks of metal. And that's the claim. And so they're saying if that evidence had been admitted into the uh, into the uh, trial, along with a wife who wasn't allowed to say that he was abusive, um, those two things let him off, essentially. Uh, so what do I think about that particular bunch of evidence? Uh, it gets, again, it's extremely tricky, extremely tricky when you're coming down to blood spatter evidence and you have the defense side, you've got the prosecution side, and they say things totally differently. So, so one says it's just expiration, expiration. How do you say that even? Ex, expiration? <laughs> Ex, blood from being, breathing. That's one side. And there's nothing in there but just the little blood. And it's all very, very not big pieces. So it's microscopic. And the other side says, well, even if it's microscopic, it came from the bludgeoning. Um, and it's impact spatter. And, and, and it's got these other elements in it. Okay. That's really confusing. And for a jury, I'm sure they're like, I ain't got a clue. <laughs> and even as an, when I consider myself an expert as a profiler, and I do have, and I have studied blood, blood stain pattern analysis. And this is one of the finest books, by the way, on the, on the, on the, on the subject. Um, but let me tell you, when you get into these, these, the details of this stuff, uh, and all the different angles things come out, and all the things that come, let me tell you, it's tough. And I don't even know that if you got two, three or four different experts, they would come up with the same opinions and the same, uh, let's say, for example, we got over 160 supposedly microscopic drops. Now, there's a claim that it's actually really three drops that when the three drops hit, they broke up into other little teeny pieces. There's another claim. So it's only three drops. Um, it's only in one little, it's so tiny. It's just hardly anything. Then you say, okay, well, let's say that she breathed. Is there any way that um, if she had blood all over her face, she already had brain matter on her face. She had that she'd already been bludgeoned with a metal object in her face. And let's say, oh, no, I, that this is now, mind you, the blood, the brain matter would be there if the bag were overhead. And you could say, well, then, then it wouldn't have the metal stuff. But you know, the bag may not have stayed stable, and it might have been a point where the, the, the bag went up like this, and the who knows? We don't weren't there, we don't know. Then there could be metal fragments in blood that was coming off of her face. So that went into her mouth, and when she breathed her... <laughs> There it was. You see, this is where it gets so bloody confusing. And that's not, sorry about the pun. <laughs> but I don't know whether I think the prosecution proves that this was an impact spatter through that. I'm not sure that's believable. So you see, there's where things get very convoluted. But I believe through all the general evidence and the, and the behavioral evidence, especially the behavioral evidence, that the evidence supports that this crime occurred 45 minutes prior to the phone call. And at that point in time, Sean Jenkins was home and he was with Billy Joe at that point in time. So they were there together when I believe the crime went down. So, uh, that's interesting. The white spirit indicates panic. I think I, it seemed, yeah, I, I would think that's like, Oh my God, I got to do something about this. I don't know what the white spirit was for. His body, the, the ground, some area who wanted to cover up the, who knows? I don't know. 
Uh, Benny says, I think the most compelling evidence in this case against Sean is that there's no other reasonable suspect. No, there isn't. And somebody obviously killed her and Sean has a lot of circumstantial evidence pointing to him. Yeah. Uh, tremendous amount. And I think if you look at this, I say this, this book, this segment in the book that shows that there's no proof that any other one, any of the girls saw Billy Joe alive after she climbed on Sean's back 45 minutes prior to the phone call. I think that to me is absolutely fascinating. And it makes much more sense that the, the, the crime occurred 45 minutes before than 20 minutes before. Makes much more sense. Um, so I think that unless you can see, that, I, I don't know if I hadn't read this, I wouldn't have had that pattern in my head. But when I read this, I was like, oh my God, I think that's the answer right here. Uh, that without that, you keep thinking that it happened 20 minutes before and then things are very fuzzy and don't make quite sense. This makes much more sense. Um, and then the possibility of the bag being over her head makes a lot more sense than another explanation for how how things happened. And that he would have, if he killed her 45, bludgeoned her 45 minutes before and his, his statement about holding her in his arms and her breathing her last makes much more sense right when the bludgeoning happened because that was a very violent bludgeoning. Um, and that statement to me does not sound like after the nine, a 999 call. That sounds to me like 45 minutes prior when it all went down. Um, uh, the Blood Spatter book is, whoops, it's Tom Bevel and uh, Ross Gardner. And it's an excellent book, but it's very complicated. And this is the best one I could find that was the most <laughs> understandable book of all the other Blood Spatter pattern books. So I've always used this one as, as a, my, my go-to book in, in crime, crime scene analysis. Um, Sarah says, uh, makes sense with the timing. Also ensure she bleeds out. Yeah, I, I, yeah that's another good point. Um, remember how he said, if I wanted, if I really wanted to, I really wanted to make it not be me. I would have just done 10 minutes. <laughs> I think he's right. I think he needed more time to go by to, to be able to figure everything out. Uh, time to clean up, time to do this, time to do that. So I think that's kind of a little hint that more time didn't he get by. Um, Christine says, I agree that the prosecution couldn't prove how the blood and bone got on his clothing. And that's why the prosecution will not insist on a fourth trial, that and the cost. Yeah, I think that's, it's, it, it's too sketchy. Um, and, you know, yeah, I, I, I think that going for a fourth trial, even if they went with my theory and moved the crime back to where I think it happened 45 minutes prior to the phone call, um, you know, um, and it makes, even if my theory explains more of what realistically happened, proving that in a court of law with a jury trial, I, I think it's still going to be it really a toss up whether they would, they would come back with guilty, especially after he's after three trials and, and all this stuff coming out. Oh, Bob is out there with the innocence thing going on. And, and, you know, I know a lot of people think he's guilty, but I think there's also a lot of people who don't, don't think he's guilty. And I think by the time that a fourth trial will come around, getting a proper jury would be <laughs> very unlikely, very unlikely. Um, Molly says, Billy Joe was in Sean's way. I don't think it could deal with family pressure anymore. And it was time for her to go. Oh, good point. Okay. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, one of the things that was happening um, right before this happened was he was, he, the, the school was about to find out he was a lying dog and he was going to lose his job probably because they, they're finding out his CV was fake. Um, and he was having problems with his wife. And on top of that, he had this teenage girl and, you know, he's trying to say, you now the kid comes to him when she's like eight. And then she's murdered five years later. She's just becoming a teenager. And she was, you tell me that a, a foster child who's already been, who's already tried to kill a kid <laughs> or two, um, who has lots of behavioral problems. And now she's becoming a teen. Things are going to get easier that suddenly she's like peachy keen and lovely. I think that's when, you know, kids who are raised well and have secure environments still have teen issues a lot of times and they're not the easiest years. Now you take a kid who's gone through a whole bunch of stuff and is still acting out. And that, that makes things, it makes a very rough home life. And so if his marriage is falling apart, his job is about to go. 
he might he might have already been building up rage toward everybody and everything. So yes, thank you for bringing that up. I think that was very important, and I didn't get a chance to point that out. So thank you. Uh, that was grand. Um, and so yeah, I think she was just one more problem that he just didn't at that moment. Again, I don't think it's premeditated. I just think that. You know, he had a volatile temper, I believe. Um, according to his wife and children, he had a volatile temper. And he's under severe pressure. And his whole perfect life, perfect man thing is about to go out the window. And then who knows what Billy Joe, you know, you can blame the victim on this type of thing. But, you know, a troublesome child. And he was already annoyed with her for not painting right, even though it was probably not her fault. Although she might have been a slob and said, I don't really care. You know, but something happened between those two i believe at that moment in time where he just he just he lost it essentially i just believe he lost it um for whatever reasons i tend not to think it's sexual i don't think necessarily although it's hard to say whether he was putting pressure on her or doing weird things i don't have any evidence of that but i do think she was not the easiest to deal with and i think he was already uh, on the edge so um so what I'm saying is it can cannot be proven beyond reasonable doubt. Hmm. Let me think about this, Joe. Um, I don't have reasonable doubt <laughs> because there's no other suspect that makes any sense because he was the last one with her because his story doesn't hold water because blah, 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 blah. I don't, I don't think, I don't have reasonable doubt. I don't. Um, but I do think because the, the physical evidence is confusing, would be confusing to the jury. I think they would have reasonable doubt. Not that it, it was, it was proper reasonable doubt, but I would think they would believe they have reasonable doubt that, and especially if they don't move it back 45 minutes, the 20 minute thing would cause reasonable doubt. I think that would really cause reasonable doubt. That was where I came from in the beginning of this, um, because I'm looking at going, did he really, did they, you know, um, did, did they really pick up Charlotte from, did he really pick up Charlotte from the clarinet lesson, bring her home. And while she went upstairs to put a clarinet away and then they went out, all of a sudden, in that one, two minutes there, he killed Billy, Billy Joe, and then raced in and said, come on, girls, we got to go to the store. I have problems with that, too. I don't, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So that's why I think that if you go with, with that happening later, it doesn't work really well. But if you back it up to when I think it happened, then you've got all this extra time because Charlotte wasn't there. See, Charlotte wasn't in the house. Only person was Annie, and Annie was outside in the front way down by the street doing that. So if he was back there and got into whatever with Billy and that's when it happened and that could happen within one or two minutes, you know, something went wrong back there and he's just washing a car out front. Now he's got time. Oh my God. Now he starts cleaning up, trying to figure out what to do, running out, to talk to Annie, bringing her water. Maybe he's cleaning up with water. Then he gets back in and he's like, okay, uh, we got to go get Charlotte and doesn't let her near that. He gets Charlotte, brings her back, thinking, well, what do I do now? Do, do I let her find the body now or do I have some more? What should I do? Charlotte says, I'm going to go down. And, no, no, no. Let's go out and get some white spirit. Then we go out, you know, and he's buying more time, um, being seen by more people. I think that's what happened. So the only time frame I think he had the time to actually commit this crime and figure out what to do about it would be 45 minutes before, way before he picked up Charlotte. Charlotte was not in the house when this happened. I can't believe that. And I think that's that's what makes people think uh, there's too much doubt here. How did he get that done in such a short period of time and not even look bloody, you know, at all? You know, nothing on him at all. How, how would that happen? Well, because Charlotte wasn't home and he was out front. He had more minutes. Remember, he said they were late getting Charlotte. They were supposed to be there earlier. But why was he late? He was a little control freak, dude. Why was he late? Because that extra five, 10 minutes he needed was while Annie was outside, he was doing whatever he had to get done. That's my belief. Um, uh, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know. That'll be interesting to do. <laughs> um, 
Uh, let's see. Christine says, a jury would think a burglar rang the bell. No one answered. He went to the back of the house, saw the tent peg, picked it up with it to force a door. Billy Joe confronted him and he hit her with it. Well, there's an inter well, that's an interesting statement. So in other words, she's not actually painting at that point and she's inside the house and then she sees him. Oh no. Okay. No, she, he comes around the house um, and wants to grabs a tent peg off the picnic table, goes toward the door and she pops out. Maybe she was inside for a second, pops out and says, what are you doing here? And he hits her with it. It's a good defense tactic. That's a good defense case. And this, this is what the defense will do. They'll, they'll propose an alternative theory that has some possibility, but then you have to ignore everything else. And, um, but that works. That's, that's what defense teams do. And that's, you know, so <laughs> yeah, uh, could happen, could happen. Uh, but I don't believe that's what happened. So again, I think it all happened 45 minutes before when Charlotte was still at the clarinet lesson. That's what I think happened. Um, and that story right there in the book, you know, I'm always amazed when I read a book from the person who supposedly is trying to prove their innocence. Sometimes what pops out from the pages from to me is things that say the opposite. And that's what this book did. So thank you, Sean Jenkins and Bob for putting this book together. Cause I, I, I don't know without this book, I would have, I would have looked at the time frame, and, and, and heard the story about what happened on the patio, you know, uh, I wouldn't have seen all of that. So that's what made the difference for me. Um, uh, why would a single tent peg be there? Uh, supposedly there were a bunch of tent pegs. I don't know. There, I think there were supposed to be more than one. I, they, they were just cleaning. I don't, I don't think it was premeditated. I don't believe so. I really don't. Um, Christine says, I don't believe it happened, but it gives jury doubt. It could because it's hard to understand. Um, it's hard to understand for people. Uh, and again, people aren't criminal profiles. They're not detectives. They're, they don't understand evidence. They don't understand time frames. They don't understand behavioral evidence. And like this, what I consider is a, an explanation of exactly when and where it happened in the book. Um, that's not their, that's not their specialty. And they shouldn't be expected to have that as a specialty, which is why I think civilian juries are, 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 are ridiculous because they're doing their best, but with no skills. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I think that's what happens. So that's my purporting of a theory. Um, I don't think it's ever going to, you know, it won't go to trial. I think he's free and, uh, he got his six years and, uh, he's got his new wife <laughs> and he got a book published and I don't know how, what the UK rules are, but since he was found not guilty after and the other trial issue, I, I don't know. You can, you can make money off of a book. So, you know, in, I know in the U.S. we have the son of Sam law where if you're found guilty of a crime, you can't put a book out and make a bunch of money off of it. Uh, but there's there's these times when that doesn't seem to actually apply totally, especially to the to Netflix and stuff like that. So, you know, people commit crimes and they those crimes pay. They do. They pay. Um, uh so Martin says, sounds like no DNA saved, so no DNA testing available today. Um, oh, there was something about, oh, what was the issue about the DNA? Um, now I'm blanking. Uh, let's put it this way. There was no evidence of another person being there committing the crime. That's all you can say. <laughs> That's what you can say. But, um, but a really interesting case. And um, yeah, I'm glad it was suggested to me because I'd never heard of it. And I thought it was really, truly interesting, especially when I got the book. I tell you, I just, I'm just, I say that I'm always more than amazed at, you know, people's attempts to convince uh, this is what happened. And I'm not convinced. And when you have a person who is, um, especially the defense, who's trying to convince you and they're failing to do it. I always find that rather fascinating because of all people, they should be able to convince the prosecution. The fact that they they are going to sway things to convince you. I get it. That, but the, when when so, but when the defense can't convince you that the person is innocent, then you, it's always interesting. Then, <laughs> so uh, touch. I, I I don't know the touch DNA thing. I I, I don't know. Uh, if that's, that's still there, it's been done, or I have no idea. Uh, I don't know anything about uh, what, what they've done with the DNA, but 
uh, so uh, all I know is that there's they have no DNA from anybody else. So. Uh, Lisa says, "Thank you for covering this case in such detail and with so many insights." Well, I'm glad I'm glad you thought so, Lisa. I was a uh, it was fascinating. Uh, uh, Benny says, Pat, thanks for an interesting lesson. And thanks for the chat with my classmates. Yay. And again, if you'd like to be here with these wonderful people in the chat room, which is the great Patreon community of people who actually are interested in learning about uh, a crime scene analysis and understanding, um, do join Patreon. Click below um, and uh, you can be a part of this. And uh, it makes a, I, I really like this special chat room because I always have a great time talking to everybody. And as you can see, there's people in the chat room have great ideas and, and great points. And also I want to thank you guys in the chat room because when you're doing a show like this um, and I, it's not an edited show. So there's things that just fly out of my head and I'm like, Oh, I didn't think of, I didn't, I didn't think of mentioning that. I, and I, it wasn't that I didn't have it planned. It wasn't in my head, but because there's so much information, sometimes I just forget. And so when you bring it up in the chat room, it really helps because then I'm like, oh, yes, yes, thank you. <laughs> and you also have good questions, which also make me have to think. Um, and sometimes excellent analysis yourself. And um, so that's why I, I like this methodology. I'm really glad that I, I, you know, when I cut the chat room off from the general public, people were like, oh, why would you do that? And I'm like, because when the general public's in there, you get like 80% full of bots, haters, and crazy people. And they just mess up the chat room and the, the seriousness is gone. And not that you can't make jokes in here because you all do, uh, but the, the just really the, the camaraderie and the, the real good good thinking is just gets lost. And so I'm, all, I'm glad I made the decision to go to Patreon chat. So if you join, you get to be part of this great community of really nice people. <laughs> um, Lisa says, uh, probably another symptom of psychopathy. I did it and you can't prove it. Ha ha. I wrote a book to show why. Well, he wrote the book. He claimed, first of all, to find out who killed his, his foster daughter. It didn't, wasn't very convincing, but mostly about convincing you that he didn't do it. Yes. Um, <laughs> Anne says, thank you, Pat. I will make sure to have garbage bags around. <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> Now, garbage bags are useful in many, many ways in crimes, and they've been used over and over again, especially really good trash bags, <laughs> good, strong ones, you know. Uh, Sarah Adams says, thank you. Love learning from everyone. And of course, Pat. Absolutely. Um, let's see. Oh, oh, the call. Oh, wait a minute. Yes, our call in. I have to figure out what we're going to do with the call in. I haven't figured out that yet. <laughs> Lisa says, love this community, Pat. Thank you. I'm glad you like the community. Me too. Me too. I really do. So again, uh, that's it for today. Um, please do, if you're new here, please do like and subscribe, share, and uh, go to that search uh, at YouTube and put in profile of Pat Brown in your favorite case. See if I've already done it. And if I haven't, let me know. Um, and I will hopefully eventually get to it if it has a, any merit to be analyzed. Um, I do, do try to get to them. So um, so I will see you next round and sometime during this week, I think we'll have the hangout and then I have to decide whether to do the call in and exactly what we're going to do the call in about. So ideas are welcome. See you later.